trouble with his computer. Um, so welcome everybody to the April 6th, the Nantucket Conservation Commission meeting. This meeting is being held entirely remotely with uh, all participants participating via Zoom app. Uh, if the public wishes to participate, they can participate via YouTube and there's directions on the town's website detailing how you may join. Uh, if you are making a comment, please make sure to state your full name and any relationship you have to a project. If you're in a butter, please uh, state your address. Um, everybody who's on the call, I ask that you keep your device muted when you're not speaking uh, so that you're not picked up by the recording and uh, drafting for our minutes taker. I also ask that everybody please raise your hand either in the camera window or virtually. Uh, and wait to be called on um, before you start speaking. Uh, so with that, um, we will open tonight's meeting with public comment on items not being heard this evening. And I do see some public comment on YouTube. We have Burton Balkind. Um, he says he doesn't see anything on the agenda for the house on cribbing at the end of Hummock Pond Road. Uh, and he saw nothing on the geo tube project. Um, so he's requesting that we put those items on a, a future public hearing. Um, so Burton, we do have a, an SBPF update at the um, other business or on the other business section of our meeting. So we will discuss that there. Um, the, uh, our staff is actively working on a few different enforcement issues that include uh, the house on cribbing at the end of Hummock Pond Road, and we'll hopefully get those up um, on a meeting agenda soon. Um, we're trying to track down everybody involved, but it is um, definitely on our radar and um, will be on a meeting soon. Um, so if there's, oh, uh, Will? Hi, Ashley, just wanted to let you know, Linda and Mark should be joining momentarily they were missing a zoom link um and my audio was not working but we're in business now okay perfect glad we're up and running um curiously enough ashley i used last week's link and it works is that common yeah i think they set them for like the month i got you well now i know or a couple months i'm not sure how they break them apart but it is for a block of time yeah, well, I took a flyer and used last week's. I, I, I like, I'm here. I like your thinking. <laughs> um, all right, so if there's not any other public comment, um, the following items are continued this evening under notices of intent. We have Nantucket Boathouse LLC at 2 and 6 Easton Street, continued until May 11th. We have Local Bowie Properties LLC at 15 Loretta Lane, continued until April 27th. We have the trustees of the reservations, Cascada Kotu Wildlife Refuge, continued until April 27th. And then under request for determination of applicability, we have Nantucket Yard Guard at 7 Gull Island Lane, also continuing until April 27th. Um, so with that, we will begin tonight's meeting um, under notices of intent. Uh, we have Boathouse Realty Trust at 52 Warren's Landing Road. Uh, and I believe we have David Haynes on to represent this one. Um, uh, good evening. Um, I'm on nice and early tonight. Um, we're supposed to have Arthur Reed joining us and I don't I don't see him on our lit on your on your list. I don't know if he is here yet. Um, but we continued this basically for uh, waiting for a response from Natural Heritage. We got a response that was favorable, uh, no adverse impact for, for either wetlands concerns or MESA concerns. This is a, an application to take an existing cottage on the end of Warren's Landing Road, right on the edge of Madiket Harbor, and to relocate it farther back and higher um, and to move it completely out of the endangered species area, out of the 50 foot back from a coastal bank and uh, um, 
and and restore that area. The um, house will be elevated on piles uh, to above the uh, flood elevation, um, and and the cesspits will be. David, can you hold on a second? Can everybody mute? We're getting some weird feedback. Sorry about that, David. No, no problem. And to uh, remove the existing septic system and replace it with a with a tight tank. So we are the 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 uh, the house currently is right up to the top of the. Uh, there's a coastal bank there. Well, it's actually a bulkhead, and. Uh, uh, a block bulkhead that um, it, the, the edge of the deck goes right up to it. So we're right at the top there. And then there's an area of uh, coastal dune in the southern part of the property and the southwestern part of the property. Um, there's a wetland to the east. It's a salt marsh with a, with a mosquito ditch in it um, that's over to the west offsite. Uh, excuse me, to the east offsite. The um, last week, there were a couple of questions that were asked. Um, uh, Mark asked about the erosion rate. I said, well, we, we did a notice of intent for this project in 1996, and it seems to be in exactly the same place. I checked the uh, erosion rate on the state maps, and it's 0 0.07 feet per year. So it's uh, it's very, very slow in that area. I also looked at the uh, looked at the coastline in there. The coastal that that block wall is right right where it is, right in line with the rest of it uh, to the north and to the south. And a funny kind of a, a it looked like there was a, a groin on the property to the north beyond Warren's Landing Road. And I, what I remember is out there, there's a drainage pipe that comes out of the wetland on the land bank property and comes out across the beach. And that is acting sort of as a groin. It's built up a little bit below it. Um, but there's no evidence of any scour uh, above or below the, the property as related to the, uh, to the uh, block retaining wall that's there. Um, we are moving it back. We are setting it back. We are raising it. We are asking for waivers for work within the 50. We are actually going back almost to the 25 uh, on the on the backside from the edge of the wetland, but it's the highest point of the property, and and we felt that was the best location for it to use the. There's a what what the highest point is is the mounted uh, leach field that's back there, and we're going to be on top of that, and then the uh, holding tank will be incorporated into it. So we're asking a waiver for work within the 50 uh, uh, for a structure within the 50 of the, that that we're moving out, but also we'll have a structure within the 50 of the wetland to the rear. And also, we're, we're doing some work within, we're working within 25 feet of the, uh, the coastal bank and the coastal dune, and also within the uh, 25 of the, uh, uh, of the wetland to the rear. Um, and also, the septic tank is, is uh, or the um, holding tank will be within two feet of the water table. So we're asking a waiver for that work. Uh, it will not be within the water table. No dewatering, a temporary or permanent, will be necessary to do it. Um, it. It's the only way we can do it. The site is very constrained. There's a the the, the hundred foot buffer zone covers the whole site. The fifty foot buffer zone just about co covers the whole site as well. Also, the area is mapped as coastal uh, as a barrier beach. Um, up to Warren's Landing. When you look at the soils out there, a barrier beach has to be either a dune or a beach. Um, and in this case, the, these are glacial deposits. The material is, uh, it's got stones in it. Um, it is not, it, it is glacial and not a beach or, or, so we're not considering it. We're not actually working the, the barrier beach would start at the dune line to the south. Um, so, but again, we're, we're working with an existing house with no other reasonable alternative. Um, 
It will be an overall improvement. We are pulling it back. We're lifting it up. We're allowing it to flood underneath it. We're putting a septic, we're replacing the septic system with a holding tank. Um, and that is basically my presentation. Do you have any questions? Thank you, David. Any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Um, so I'll open this one up for public comment. And any public comment on 52 Warren's Landing Road? I am not seeing any public comment. Um, Will, do we have everything we would need to close? Yes, we do, Ashley. Uh, David, would you like to close? Uh, yes, please. Is there a motion to close? A uh, oh, second. A second, Marks. All right, so motion made by Mark, seconded by Linda. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Mizzarelli? Aye. Landowski? Aye. Williams? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too, David. Uh, and that moves us on to McLean at 100 Madikasham Valley Road, represented by Brian Madden. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brian Madden from LEC, uh, representing the applicant. Uh, proposed project involves um, maintenance of uh, existing beach stairs uh, that were installed previously without benefit of a permit. Uh, some restoration of the 25 foot buffer zone to the top of the coastal bank uh, and continued maintenance of existing snow drift fencing uh, down along the toe of the uh, coastal bank. There's also a proposed patio uh, within the outer 100 foot buffer zone, 72 feet from the top of the coastal bank at the closest point uh, with a connecting boardwalk to the house. Um, that's partially within the 100 foot buffer zone. Uh, at the last meeting, we continued uh, because we didn't have natural heritage letter. Um, that was received on the 24th, the day after the meeting, although the letter was dated the 23rd. So <laughs> unfortunately, um, well, fortunately, now we have it. Uh, they just instituted the time of year restrictions for the shorebirds uh, nesting uh, season for any maintenance down along the beach associated with the stairs and the snow drift fencing. At the last meeting, we had talked about uh, putting some conditions onto the order for monitoring of the fencing to make sure it doesn't become dislodged during storms and uh, become a debris issue. Um, and then there was also some requests to um, add some uh, stabilization plantings where appropriate. Uh, which we're more than happy to accommodate um, where we can. And uh, with that, I'll turn over to questions. Thank you, Brian. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. So I've, I've given this a significant amount of thought and I think we should request the applicant to remove the snowdrift fencing um, for a few reasons. Um, so the first is that although the, the configuration that was used, the zigzag, is typical of um, like the sand drift fencing that is more in favor these days, the material is still like that snow fencing that is really susceptible to breaking up. And I appreciate the applicant being willing to do monitoring, but I think no matter how much monitoring is done, that is gonna get into the environment um, and cause hazards to our protected interests of wildlife, especially and wetland scenic views. Uh, so um, I think also, Typically, there's more benefit for having like temporary snow fencing in the winter, 
Um, if the applicant wants a more permanent solution, I think they should come back with a revised plan either for the sand drift fencing that's built right or some other type of stabilization. But I don't feel comfortable having this sort of half measure in there that was originally put in without a permit when a more, um, a less impactful uh, technique to the environment could be used. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Linda, I see your hand up. Uh, question, we're talking about beach stairs, right? At this time? So they have that beach disappeared. stairs. Disappeared. There's a few aspects to the project. They have beach stairs. There's a, a proposed patio and a little bit of a boardwalk that are kind of near the hundred. Yeah. Uh, and they're requesting to keep the um, fencing that was put in previously without a permit. But we're replacing the beach stairs, correct? Yes, that's part disappeared. Of it. Now, are you? I, I, I know, know I've been. I don't know if they've disappeared. Let's let Brian answer that question. Well, that I'll follow up. He can answer both questions through you, Madam Chair. Um, I know you guys have been requiring beach stairs that are off the uh, that are not embedded in the bank. First off, but then are removed in the winter. Is that part of this plan of replacement? Uh, to answer that second question, they are aluminum beach stairs, so they can be removed if that's what the commission would like to see. Um, and to the, the, the first question, the stairs are currently there. Um, it, so, um, it's not a rebuild. Okay. And, um, I was just trying to go back and look at some older, uh, aerial images so i think um i think those that sand the snow fencing has been present um and since like at least 2015 2014 i'm seeing um a little bit um on nantucket gis you can see the fencing uh, I believe in the same configuration as it currently stands. So we're, we're on five years of it being present, um, but certainly, um, you know, would welcome other commissioner feedback on that. Um, I have to say, I hate the snow fencing because it does end up as like a giant beach tumbleweed. Um, I, I, I asked Morgan to, deal with some in Surfside this year because they have 60 feet and then all of a sudden the ocean's taking them away. So I kind of have to agree with Seth a little bit. Um, Mike, I see your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, well, Brian partially answered my question, but wouldn't, isn't the snow fence pretty entrenched at this point? So I, I, I haven't seen it, mind you, but I, I'd be concerned that ripping it out would be uh, kind of messy and disturb a lot of, a lot of things. That's just where I'm at with it at the moment. Yeah, I had, I had included some photographs. There are certainly sections of it that are are deeply embedded, more so closer towards the airport. Um, but I'd say maybe approximate to the beach stairs, looking at the photographs, we're talking close to a half. A third to a half of the fencing being buried. And I'm, I'm sorry, uh, through you, Madam Chair, back to Seth. What 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 is a, considered a, a softer solution to uh, snow fence in your estimation? I mean, I'm, I've always, you know, seen it, thought it was effective. I certainly don't disagree that it can make a mess. Um. Yeah, we tend to permit more robust fencing in that same sort of zigzag where it's actually like, you know, um, timbers nailed together versus the snow fence yeah. configuration that you kind of buy in rolls. So it's a little yeah. bit more robust that we'd actually be looking for. One's yeah. like on the North Shore. Is that what we're talking about? Yes. But the Dionys, they're, they're like almost a structure up there. Different. Yes, exactly. 
Yeah, if I may, Madam Chair, and actually softer isn't specifically what I'm going for, but um, I don't necessarily have a problem with like using fencing to capture sand. I think it's effective, but I think the like actually sand drift fencing that's designed for that, it as has been said before, is just less likely to break up. And there's also not so much wire associated with it, you know, birds fly into that wire and break wings. And I mean, it just sort of like that snow fencing is not really made for a beach environment. It becomes a hazard. Um, so if the applicants want to use a fence, I ask them to replace it with the sand drift fence or if they want to do something else, then that's up to them. But that's where I'm at. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Uh, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no at this point. So we'll open up 100 Madikasham Valley Road for public comment. It does not appear that we have any public comment on YouTube. Um, Will, would we have everything we needed to close? We do, yes. Okay. Would anybody like further discussion about the fence, uh, Mark? Yes, thank you, Ashley. I, I'm, I'm torn by the fence. I, I agree with the, uh, the theory that a, a does, snow fence designed for sand sand catching is much more effective and. I don't know what's more effective, but I, I agree that I've seen uh, snow fence that's that's been uh, washed away and it's really gets in the way. And I think it should be uh, discouraged whenever possible. And I would be supportive of a uh, properly designed snow catching device along this beach, but I don't think it should be uh, it should be the traditional rollout snow fence with with and, and the wire troubles me a lot too. Uh, not so much the birds flying in, which may happen, but I'm more concerned with the wire getting getting loose on the beach and being a hazard. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, would anybody else like to weigh in about the uh, fencing? Okay. Um, so Brian, it, it, it looks like I know myself, Seth and, and Mark have some concerns about the uh, snow fence being used. Um, I'm guessing the other commissioners don't. Is that something you you think your client would be willing to consider a change? Yeah, I think they'd be willing to consider. I think they just would need to review it a little bit more uh, in detail. I mean, if um, if the majority of the commission uh, would like to see it removed, I would just ask that if it gets conditioned in that manner, there's some period of time so we can come in with a new application for um, the, the more standardized drift fencing and we're not having um, kind of an exposed area um, prior to that work. Okay. Um, Seth? Yeah, if I may offer a solution. I mean, currently the fence is in place, unpermitted, and we haven't issued any enforcement on it. So um, if we just uh you know issue a positive order of conditions on this project but say that the snowdrift fence is not included in that order and then just internally don't issue an enforcement and then it can stay in place until they come back with the sand drift fence uh, plan as long as they um you know are being a good applicant and setting to a good timeline then we'll just trust them. And if for some reason they change their mind, then we'll issue an enforcement on them. And then we'll be back here where we are today. So I think that's I'm comfortable great. with that. Okay. Um, well, it sounds like that should work. So um, Brian, at this point, are you ready to close? Yes, please. Is there a motion to close? I'll make that motion based on what Seth just said when we get to the um, order of conditions. Okay, perfect. So motion made by Linda. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Seth. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. 
Aye. Mizzarelli? Aye. Landowski? Aye. Williams? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Brian. And that moves us on to Nantucket Island's Land Bank, South Shore Beach, um, represented by Rachel Freeman. Good evening, thank you very much. Um, I am here tonight to basically ask if Will received the Natural Heritage Letter. Um, this, this was an application, a notice of intent that I discussed at the previous meeting requesting um, multiple sets of permission to install multiple sets of aluminum beach stairs on, along the South Shore. And to the best of my understanding, the commission, I was able to answer all of the commission's questions and we were simply waiting on a response from Natural Heritage. I have a copy of the letter and if you'd like me to mail it to you or email it to you, I'm perfectly happy to do that. Um, the letter, as with all of our aluminum beach stairs for Natural Heritage, has some restrictions, which we have discussed with them and are happy to abide by. We will be routinely checking the habitat so that if it does appear to be good habitat, again, a lot of these areas where we're installing aluminum stairs are not great habitat for plovers. But if that changes, uh, we will be well aware of it and will likely not install the stairs in that area and or take appropriate measures. Thank you, Rachel. Will, did the office receive the heritage letter? Double checked, yes, we did. Okay. <laughs> um, so any questions or comments from commissioners on this one? Great. It um, looks like no, I do wanna just say the same comment again. Just, I'm so thankful for the land bank uh, allowing the public to access Nantucket's beautiful beaches in so many different locations. Um, Thank you. Check uh, to see if there's any public comment for the South Shore Beach stairs. Uh, does not appear that we have public comment at this point. Um, with the heritage letter, I know we have what we need to close. So Rachel, would you like to close? Yes, please. Is there a motion to close? Motion made by Ian. Is there a second? Second, second Madam Chair. Mike, yeah, Mike, back. <laughs> give Mike the second. Uh, and by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. Williams. Aye. Great. That carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to our next Nantucket Islands land bank at 261 Hummock Pond Road, represented by Rachel Freeman. Thank you very much again. Uh, this was an uh, interesting one. This was an oversight on my part. Uh, we were proposing to remove uh, dead pine trees in this area and I thought we required natural heritage permission. It is actually priority habitat and not estimated habitat. So um, we, I just am asking to close if possible. We needed permission to be able to remove dead pines within a hundred feet of the coastal dune. Um, Coastal Bank. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank Are you. there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no, so we'll just open it up for public comment on 261 Hummock Pond Road. Does not appear that we have public comment. Um, Will, do we have everything we would need to close? Indeed we do. Rachel, would you like to close? Yes, please. Is there a motion to close? So I move, Madam Chair. Motion made by Linda, is seconded by Mike. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. Williams. Aye. That carries unanimously. We've got a lot for you here in a row, Rachel. <laughs> Um, so our next one, Nantucket Islands Land Bank at 21 and 27 Sackage Road, represented by Rachel Freeman. Thank you very much. This notice of intent is before you this evening for a variety of changes or indoor improvements to walkways at our Sackage Road properties in Quidnet. 
The land bank owns multiple properties that abut Sacagawea Pond, and we're proposing um, at 21 and 27 Sacagawea Pond to make improvements that involve stormwater. At 21 Sacagawea Road, we are proposing to basically put in a Cape Cod berm, which is an asphalt edge to the road to facilitate stormwater moving down further along the road. Um, into a series of swales that I'll describe in a moment, and then putting in uh, th approximately three stairs or a bit of a terraced walkway. Uh, this was originally spec to be 4.5 feet wide. I reduced that to two feet. It's a combination of gravel with timbers, which will basically any water that came over the Cape Cod berm would hit the gravel, the timber, and be shed to one side. The goal is ultimately to allow this pathway to be maintained. At this point, it's somewhat of a gully and um, is regularly eroded anytime there's a rainstorm. As you travel further down, uh, the Sacagawea Road here, what you get to is a parcel, a land bank parcel, which is abutted on both sides by Mass Audubon. And it is also another pathway to the beach at Sacagawea Pond. This pathway has two functions. One is actually as an incredible way to for stormwater to access the pond. Um, I was shocked when I went out there during a huge rainstorm to see the amount of stormwater that was actually flowing all the way down that walkway and into the pond. Uh, and this was brought to our attention um, by the town of Nantucket's Natural Resources Department. And uh, they recommended that if we could, it would be very helpful for the health of the pond to put swales in this area to pick up the storm waters before it actually hit the pond. And so that's what we've proposed here tonight. We have two swales on either side of the path and a culvert connecting underneath the path. Part of the reason for the culvert is because the swales are unbalanced. Um, originally, I did, I did make a couple of revisions to this plan, as you can see right before the meeting. Um, originally, we were discussing working with Mass Audubon on this, on this um, plan, and they still, Sam still needs to work his way through their process in order to do that. So for right now, I'm only permitting anything that's happening on the land bank property. So we have these unequal swales, and um, the culvert underneath will allow water to flow between the two if one side is picking up too much and is going to overflow. At the same time, we have had a request from the homeowners in the area uh, to install an ADA compliant boardwalk along this path. And the land bank is always looking to uh, increase access, accessible um, access on its properties. And this pathway presents an interesting opportunity to do that because of the topography. It is extremely flat and that just naturally makes it easier to use for an accessible boardwalk. We're proposing a 4.5 foot wide boardwalk, which is inlaid into um, the ground. At this point right now, the pathway kind of dips down and what we are hoping to do is actually just lay the boardwalk so that it's flush with the ground. Um, there's some concerns about access for boats and um, allowing sunfish to be taken down there on um, hand trailers. We don't see that this will be impacted by this because it is flush to the ground. Uh, and there is a turnaround area at the end um, and or seating area where you could actually meet ADA requirements to allow for a turnaround of a wheelchair and heading back towards the road. That is the bulk of what we were presenting tonight and I'm happy to answer any questions on it. Um, we're excited, this has been a long time coming. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Ian? Yeah, thank you, Ashley. So, Rachel, am I correct in saying that there aren't going to be any handrails? No, there are no handrails proposed at this time as it's flush with the ground. On, on, and on the other, on the, um, 
on the axis that's uh, closer to the um, the house. Right, there will not be any handrails there. Great, well, wonderful. Thank you for reassuring me. <laughs> Seth, I saw your hand go up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so respectfully, I think this is a good opportunity to, instead of trying to have the two separate access points to just consolidate the access points at the 27 parcel. Um, the one at 21, I mean, I go to this property all the time. It, I'm pretty sure its history is just by people walking over the bluff there. It was never really purposely created. And then storm water went down. Um, and if we're already going to spend the time and effort of making a ADA a compliant, like really nice boardwalk to get to a beach access point that I, I could measure on the map here, but we're talking maybe a couple hundred feet or less to the east of where the other one is. It just makes sense to close off the access at 21 and just consolidate the access points at 27. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um, Rachel, is that something you think the land make might be willing to look into? Uh, I I'm happy to look into it. That access has been there for as long as I know. Um, I will mention that I want oversight on my part. We are currently working with the abutter uh, who lives at 17 Sasakaja Road and has a um, you know active interest in what we're doing with that walkway. Um, I feel like there is significant enough reason to warrant the two accesses on this property in part because uh, there's you know walking is not always easy for everyone. And to walk from the parking lot down to the 27 beach, you know, 27 Sasakaja beach, then followed by walking back up the beach to find a, an available seating area is, is a little bit longer. Um, I do believe the land bank would be reluctant to close a beach access like that, um, but I can certainly entertain the idea. Well, if I may, Madam Chair, Yes, you know, you, I respectfully disagree with Seth and please don't entertain it. So I've been going down that way all my life and, you know, locals take their children down that way. And um, so I'm happy to keep it the way it is. And uh, so I would encourage you to, I would encourage my august compatriot, Mr. Engelborg, to reconsider. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Mike? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would be in favor of keeping both access points just um, for beach accessibility and um, some of the other reasons we heard here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Any other questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. So we'll open up 21 and 27 Sackage Road for public comment. I, I would like to be heard. Um, okay, can you um, state your full name for us, Danielle, and any um, relationship you have to the project, including an abutting address? My name is Danielle De Benedictus, and I own the property at 17 Sasakaja Road, uh, which abuts the 21 access point. I've, I have been suffering from all sorts of problems, including people coming into my house, trying to use my bathroom, coming down this path, to lugging boats down and putting them in my front yard so that I have to hire people to move them so I can sit on my own beach. Um, I even had somebody uh, burn my teak furniture that's on my own beach to create a bonfire. And it's been, and, and many people park right in front of the gate to my, which is a sole entrance to my house, so that I can't get out of my house, which in a medical emergency would be a terrible situation. And I have had to call 
the police on numerous occasions. And then I haven't got time to wait for them because I'm trying to get out of my house and I have to walk all the way down to 27 to even get out of my house. And so I fully support only having the one access down at 27 because I feel the access at 21 is being misused mostly for people to come down and leave their boats and sit in my front yard. They don't go to the left. They just plop themselves down in my yard. And many times when I've asked them to leave, they don't even leave. They've come up to my deck and asked me if I could, they could use my bathroom like I'm a public bathing house. And it's been one thing after another. So to create a situation here where it's more easily accessible to people, I'm all in favor of correcting the water problem at the street. And I'm, I'm just not in favor of creating those steps which will make it more attractive for people to come down that path. And people are bringing their boats down that path. At the very least, I'd like to have it uh, posted that no boats are allowed down this path and that they would be required to use the 27 path for, for their boats. It is unbelievable how many boats come down there and then people put the boat in my yard, not on the beach. Um, thank you for expressing those concerns. I think um, it sounds like definitely some better signage is in order um, for for the border of your of your property at the very least. Um, and one other thing I wanted to say is, of course, as you get older, the way I have, I forget how many years um, the path has been in existence, but it certainly wasn't in existence when I brought the property in 1980, and probably for 20 years thereafter. So. You know, I would say that the path is no more than 15 years, but I could stand corrected because um, my reflection of dates um, could be inaccurate, but it is not something that has been in existence the way the 27 path has been in existence from time immemorial. And, you know, we used to participate when our children were young in the sailboat races. Everybody was very respectful. They kept their boats all down by 27. And I don't think it's too much to ask to have boats forbidden from going down the 21 path at the very least. And then I don't know about whether or not some buffer vegetation uh, could be put in to the site because it's right, it's nine feet away from the picture window to my living room. Um, well, certainly we can uh, discuss some of that here at the CONCOM. I think some might be also worth discussing directly with the land bank. Um, I did have conversations with the land bank um, prior to this meeting and, and indicated that I'd be happy to try to work with them and walk the site with them, et cetera. Okay, well, that, that's great. And again, thank you for expressing your concerns. Um, we'll, we'll definitely take those into consideration. Thank you very much for letting me be heard. Yes. Um, Linda, I see your hand up. Just out of morbid curiosity, I did drive out there the other day. I had to go out to Quindant and won't win it. And is there a reason why we have to have 21 and 27 instead of just 27? Just curious. Is there a reason why we have to have 21? I do know her house very well. And I yeah. have seen people blocking it completely. But I'm just curious as to why we need both. They're fairly close together, but they both go to the same place. So I didn't know why we needed 21 and 27 instead of just improving 27. Um. Thank you, Linda. I think that speaks to Seth's previous question and um, comment. And uh, Seth, do you have a follow-up? Yes, if I may, and also respond to a bit of the comments from Rachel. Um, so, I, you know, I don't want to be like a stick in the mud about this, but I think, and I think the idea of um, having different access for people of different abilities is extremely important. But if you think about who's going to be able to use the access at 21, it's primarily able-bodied people and people who are going to require some accommodations are going to go down to the access at 27. You know, it's mostly a flat, mostly paved road until the very end. And then there's going to be a beautiful, you know, accessible boardwalk there. Um, so the people that are going to be able to go down 21 are most likely going to be able to traverse the 250 feet I just measured on Google Maps between the bottom of the two access points. I think some of uh, Ms. 
to Benedictus is points are outside of our purview. Um, but I think, uh, you know, just consolidating the access to one point is going to allow that bank to revegetate um, and to, yeah, I, I think the point about creating the stormwater berm there is fine. It's just going to be better for the protected resource areas, in my opinion. And I understand what Ian's saying, and I know there's a historical element to it, but from just a purely uh, regulatory resource-based standpoint, it makes much more sense to me to just consolidate it, consolidate the access points. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Um, Linda, I see your hand up. Seth said it better than me, but I agree with Seth to consolidate it at 27. It's easier to access and it's, it can be, they can put a split rail fence across 21 and everybody can go down to 27. Thank you, Linda. Uh, and then uh, RJ, I see your hand up. Thank you, Chair Ersman, RJ Turcotte on behalf of the Nantucket Land Council. Uh, I normally am championing as much public access as possible, but in this case, Sacaja has a lot of water quality issues. It's one of the only ponds on Nantucket that we consistently see fish kills of striped bass, no less. It's kind of a tragedy. And um, through you to Rachel, if the if closing off 21 and trying to restore that um, is possible, and it doesn't overload the stormwater infrastructure they're planning to put in, um, I think that would be a benefit to water quality in Sacagawea Pond in general, aside from um, the fact that it would be concentrating human activity over there. So just curious if Rachel knows if that uh, stormwater infiltration would be able to handle um, the little bit extra runoff that's probably going down the path at 21. Thank you. Thank you, RJ. Um, Rachel, do you have any insight? Um, I believe it probably will handle the additional stormwater because that's why we put in the Cape Cod berm. Um, my intention is actually to take the stormwater out of going down the path at 21. Um, I do, because we're not, we're actually working to not have any stormwater go down the path at 21. I'm not 100% sure what the environmental benefit would be as much for the pond, since we're actually actively working to redirect the stormwater further down the road and to the culvert and the stormwater basin that we're going to create. Um, I feel like this project is like an extreme benefit to the environment in general. And the Land Bank Commission is really going to um, be reluctant to close that public access. And for a variety of reasons, it's a bit of a slippery slope when there's not a huge environmental benefit to closing that public access to starting to close accesses to beaches. Uh, if it was a massive environmental benefit, I could definitely see that. We have about 27 accesses around my Comet Pond. I would love to see some of those closed. It's all from anglers just walking down and you know, creating space where there is active runoff going into the pond. That is not the case with what is going on by 21. I understand we have a butter who's concerned. Um, and like I said, I have talked to her earlier. We are happy to work with her, but I think it is, um, a concerning precedent to set when there's not an extreme environmental benefit or any, to, to my opinion, it's it's very limited environmental benefit um, considering we're running all the stormwater down and creating the swales further down the road to actually capture it. When I was out there earlier, the vast majority of the water, because I actively have gone out there in a number of rainstorms, pours down that road at 27. Um, and that's where the water's really going. And so that is where we've targeted to create swales. Um, so I have to admit that that is not on the top of the land banks list to close beach accesses. Thank you, Rachel. Um, RJ, do you have a follow-up? And then Mark, I do see your hand up. Um, thank you, uh, Rachel, through you, Ashley. I 
completely blanked on the fact that the berm is going to be directing that to 27 anyways. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mark, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Ashley. Um, I plead guilty to being a regular user of the speech, and um, I appreciate Mrs. Benedictus' parking problem and cars in front of her house, but moving the uh, access will not help that problem. That's not really our problem anyway. It's a very popular spot, but my, my comment is that uh, more than several times during the summer when uh, my nephews and nieces and grandchildren use that beach and they do love it, uh, water quality notwithstanding, um, uh, there are people on a, on a, who pass each other, one coming, one going, and the parent, the, the, the beach, uh, you have to pass on a, a narrow walkway, and therefore you're going into uh, one of our uh, protected areas. So I think keeping two is important, uh, even though the, the new one on 27 will be a, um, a walkway. I think that this narrow path on 17 is um, important to keep, just to keep more access to the beach. I sort of stand with Rachel, is, more is better. And it's a, it's a slippery slope to begin closing off beaches when there's only two good solid accesses from the parking area. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, any other questions or comments from either commissioners or the public at this point? I, I would like to just point out that the new pathway would be double the size of what the existing pathway is at least. And so therefore, if we eliminated the pathway at 21, um, the new pathway would be replacing the same width that exists in two different points. And to have it uh, a pathway that I know, I mean, I can now do some research on this between now and whenever this is finalized, but I know it hasn't been in time and memorial. In fact, I know it's been, you know, maybe 15 years at the most um, that this has even existed. And what happens is people are lazy. And most of the time, the people that are lazy um, are young people that are coming down there um, who are able-bodied, as was correctly pointed out by someone else. And they come down and instead of uh, going to the left where there's plenty of places to sit, they come and they actually sit in my furniture in my yard and put yeah. their boats in my yard. And so I just think it's creating a pathway yeah. for lazy people. Yes, so we understand your concern. I think that the land bank will hopefully put up some signage um, and it might be worth also you putting up some signage that, you know, it's it's private property. Um, I have put up signage and it's torn down every night and they, they come down, they actually start bonfires in front of my house. Um, well, I am I am truly sorry for that. Um, and, and hopefully... Um, I know. just want to go on record that it's a lot more than the parking. And I know I can address the parking with the DPW. Um, well, again, thank, thank you for expressing your concerns. Um, any other comments from commissioners or the public at this point? Um, and if not, uh, Will, do we have everything we would need to close this one? Yes, I believe we do. Do commissioners feel like we need any more discussion around the paths or can we wait till um, the order to maybe see if we can parse things out there? I'm good. All right, Rachel, would you like to close? I would, I will add, I'm I'm more than happy to work with Ms. Benedictus to deal with the butter relations and you know public issues. Thank you. Um, all right, is there a motion to close? Ian, are you making that motion? Oh, you're muted. I, I am, Madam Chair, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, Mark, are you giving the second? All right, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Mizzarelli? Aye. Landowski? Aye. Williams? Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. On um, that brings us to Nantucket Islands Land Bank at 19 Walwinnett Road, represented by Rachel Freeman. I have to recuse from this one, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Linda. Good evening. Thank you very much. Um, and I am here tonight presenting 
a um, notice of intent for the Nantucket Land Bank to begin um, introducing some farming practices uh, back to the property at 19 Walwinet Road. We have ongoing work at the property right now, which has been permitted. And uh, I would like to let the commission know that we received your comments from your site visit and we have fully silt fenced the property at this point. Um, sorry that didn't happen ahead of time on that side. That was a, a portion that we weren't completely paying attention to because it was on the NISDA side of the property. So we have remedied that. Um, all of the wetland areas are now so fenced. Uh, in the meantime, while the house has or the barn has been moved on the property and the um, pool was removed in the existing open NOI, we have also performed some vegetation management, removing the privet on the property and rest working to restore the property to its original condition when it was a farm. And the property is approximately 3.26 acres. It is highly surrounded by wetland resources. There's a um, spring that runs through the property, which has quite a cultural history. It's extremely well known. And there's actually a plaque there for being an area where when there's no water anywhere else on the island, the spring continues to run. And that flows directly through the property uh, down through a pipe and across to the NISDA property, which is next door, and out into Fulpus Harbor, which is immediately across the street from the property. Um, we recognize the environmental sensitivity of this site, so we're well aware of this when we're proposing small farming operations. Um, this property was put out for a request for response from local farmers, and the person who is performing farming activities on the property will be living in the house. And the goal is to utilize the two pastures that are currently in pasture um, to basically do some level of farming activity. Again, being wise to the fact that the goal is to maintain the environmental resources in the wetlands surrounding this site and not impact the harbor at any level. With that in mind, we have proposed a water sampling protocol and we've also been doing soil testing. We'd like to continue to do soil testing and examine what, um, over the course of the season, what type of background testing we can establish for surface water so that we can then respond accordingly if we continue to test and we find that any there's any change in nitrogen levels and you know we can we can assess whether or not that was due to any agricultural practices happening on the property. Um, the other thing that we are here asking for tonight is an eight foot high fence to go around the two pastures. The goal of the fence is obviously to exclude deer from the property, not from the entire property as a whole, but from the areas that Bogtown Farm is proposing to perform farming activities on. And the fence right now is basically designed that we would be looking to keep it outside of or on or within the basically outside of the 25 foot buffer so that it is between the 25 and the 50 foot buffer and that it would either be installed on the edge of the pasture or the 25 foot buffer, whichever comes first. Um, what we're seeing is that in the wetlands delineation, we have the 25 foot buffer is interior on the pasture in some areas and those don't seem like very wise areas to be farming. So we're planning to put the fence interior of that. Um, this property is interesting when we discuss agriculture because uh, historically it's been farmed um, as far back as you know the 1800s. It was a four a, a four part of a 400 acre farm known as Epire Farm. Sorry, Epire Spring Farm or the Sexton Farm because I believe it was owned by the Sexton family. One piece that was really interesting to me is that this agricultural operation really wasn't broken up and subdivided until 1972, 
when they began to sell off tracts of land for real estate development. Um, that is only 50 years ago, which to me is just yesterday. So <laughs> um, I think uh, we are well aware that this is a 3.26 acre property and to receive agricultural exemptions from the Conservation Commission at this point, it either has to be in chapter 61A or over five acres. This property is not over five acres. We've been working with um, the National Resources Department to discuss whether or not there could be something written into the um, bylaw revisions that discusses um, you know, whether or not agriculture on public land could be on smaller parcels than five acres. And the real reason for that is because, um, you know, not to just become exempt from the wetland regulations, but the real reason for that is that large farms are a thing of the past. Um, Bartlett's and Moore's End are large farms on Nantucket, but everything else is going to be small. And if we're looking to reintroduce more local farming to the island, we need to be thinking about what's a realistic size for local farming. And in New England, and particularly on Nantucket, five acres is, you know, about a thousand in Ohio. It's just, it's, it's just a huge tract of land. And so looking to produce locally grown food for sustainability and to resolve food insecurity issues and for public benefit is an important component of the land bank mission. And in order to do that, we're, we're really trying to do it at a scale that works for Nantucket. Um, we are more than happy to work with the Conservation Commission to see how we can accomplish this goal. Right now, we really don't have a farm plan to propose because um, we really want to do more environmental, um, you know, really establish the environmental baseline for this property with soils and water and take a look at how it responds over the course of the year. And we also just simply aren't ready to propose a farm plan at this point. Um, we would like to consider cover cropping. Uh, we do not have an active well at this time on the property. So that's something that we don't like, can't even discuss irrigation today. Um, but you know, it is something that I would like to be working with the Conservation Commission on to farm these two pastures. I think the last component of farming that we're proposing at this time is the potential installation of a hoop house. And the goal for the hoop house is to, well, the location of the hoop house is between the main house and the existing chicken coop. And the reason I put it there is because it's actually the best location that will be outside of the 50. Um, and it also was the, um, location of the former pool. So it's a highly disturbed area. Hoop houses are beneficial. NRCS actually, that's the Natural Resource Conservation Service, actually uh, recommends them and will fund them because they firmly believe that they reduce soil erosion issues and contamination of waterways due to soil erosion. Uh, because there's there's not active tilling and it's a very contained unit. Um, and so we are proposing to install a coop house between the house and the chicken coop at this time. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sure there's going to be lots. And I would really love to begin the discussion of how we can work with the Conservation Commission to make this happen. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? And Will, can you stop the screen share when you get a chance? Thank you. Um, Seth, I see your hand up and then Ian, I saw you. Thank you, Madam Chair. A few questions and a few comments. Should I do them all together or? Sure, yeah. All right. So the first question is, I'm wondering about how access to the north field with machinery or vehicles will be achieved because it looks like the only real road in there is over the NISDA property. Have they granted you permission to use that or are you going to try to maintain an access on site, which would unfortunately have to go right over 
the stream, which I would have some concerns about. We uh, have, do you want me to wait till you're done or do you want me to answer as we go? Whatever is easier for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, we have an easement across the NISDA property. So the planned access right now is um, through a portion of their driveway. It's basically, um, you know, coming out. If you if you did share the screen, I could show you <laughs> on the plot plan. Um, it is coming out exactly right there. Yep, basically between the chicken coop and um, the first headwall of the stream, and then going straight down to the NISDA driveway right there, and then up towards that field. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Rachel, I can't see that because um, it's not in focus. So um, may I, through you, Ashley, I guess to Will, this is the second uh, plot plan that I've been unable to read because um, when I try to get it to the right scale, both on my iPad and on my laptop, uh, the resolution is so poor that um, it's unreadable. So, you know, I, I can't really make a decision because I don't know what I'm making a decision on in terms of looking at the plot plan. Thank you. So I'm, I'm not sure what's gone wrong there. Uh, it's probably just the, the quality of the scan. Um, yeah. yeah, we need it to be a high resolution so that we can actually see what's going on. We can do better. We can and I can help with that a little bit, Ashley, if I may. Yes, um, uh, all over Ian, the Ian, if you look, if you look on the eastern side of the um, land bank property, there's a, a dashed line that ends up saying you uh, utility easement, and that's I was on the property uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, land bank Jeff showed me the easement, and it's roughly where those two dashed lines are which looks sort of like a road and it's not exactly there, but it goes along their property line um, and gives them access to the, the back field. Is that accurate, Rachel? Yes. Do you see the dashed lines, uh, Ian? Well, I do, Mark, and thank you. But, you know, I gave up trying to figure out what was going on on the plan just because it's uh, illegible at a scale for me to read. And I assume I'm not the only one who had that issue with it. Yeah, I think we get a variety of different quality. Some of the PDFs are such high quality that they won't even open because they have so much stuff going on. And then some are like older. Right. Yeah. So right. I, I think maybe um, it's worth if, if you're noticing this in the packet and you're having difficulty contacting the office right away. So maybe we can get something up you know, ahead of the meeting that um, is more easily um, discernible for everybody. Um, Good point. Yeah, but I think um, the message received and hopefully we'll get better quality plans. Um, yes, we can work on that. And then I so. do want to kind of give it back over to Seth because Rachel was in the middle of uh, answering one of the questions and I know he had some other um, questions, comments, concerns. Thank you. Um, so it sounds from your discussion tonight that the land bank and the farmer are willing to restrict their fencing and farming activities to be outside the 25 foot buffer, is, is that correct? Yes. Okay, I would definitely prefer to see that, that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and then this, the third question is on the plan, kind of in the north part of, your property, but under the exclusive use area for benefit part on the NISA property, there's some like existing patio and landscape timber walls that say rehabbed. Is that part of this application? Or is that something from the past? Right, this is getting confusing with multiple applications. Uh, that was actually permitted by Brian Madden, and we are simply taking the existing um area which is degraded there's the timbers are rotting and um there's kind of a bench that's falling apart and there is a plan to basically renovate it um but it's very similar to what is there now 
but yes, that was previously approved. Okay. Um, and then a couple comments. The first is, um, I don't have any concern about the hoop house as proposed. I think it will be good, but I also was able to visit the site and saw the site of what I could only imagine being a magnificent greenhouse attached to the house in the past. Um, and this might st stray a little bit from the concom purview, but I think you have an excellent opportunity to restore that and use that as well, especially for educational use. I would hate to see that structure, which is so unique and valuable just to go to be removed or to go to waste. So I think there's opportunity there. Thank um, you for pointing that out. Yes, we are actually um, going to be restoring that. We were working on doing it before summer. Um, the people who are coming down to restore it think it's going to take up to five weeks, which because they're going to work on another greenhouse too, which means that we need five weeks of housing for them. So we are actually going to begin the restoration of that greenhouse in the fall. Okay. And education is, is definitely a, a potential part of this farming endeavor. It's a very public property. And, you know, that's, that's one of the goals. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know we're not really getting into like the farming operations of the farm plan right now. I think the um, idea to just plant cover crops for now is fine. I do want to let you know in advance that I'm probably going to have some significant points to say, though, about the farm plan when it comes into place, because I think we need to make sure that we're using like really a, a creative approach here. I know like in some of the materials that the land bank provided, um, you know, there was an idea to like make fence out of willow. And although I like the idea of living fence, I think it's interesting. We shouldn't be planting non-native um, and in some cases potentially invasive plants in this area. We should be using uh, plants that, you know, highlight the native ecosystem. I know there's also some possibility of maybe having like a lavender field out there. I love lavender. I think it's nice, but there, I think there is going to be some concerns about how wet that soil is, but I'll hold all those for later. Just want you to know, I think this is going to have to be a sort of a back and forth process. So when you, you. Uh, when you, when you communicate with your farmer, you know, what their expectations are, know that some of the expectations are likely going to have to change. I appreciate your comments ahead of time. So, you know, we can go into this process thinking that through thoroughly. So thank you. Thank you as well. Uh, Ian, I think you had had your hand up, if I remember correctly. Uh, no, I just uh, was interrupting Seth earlier and I do apologize, Seth, for interrupting you on that subject. Um. So I know, Rachel, I um, have concerns about the fence. I, I realize that deer are so problematic and they're crushing my garden on the regular. Um, but because we have to, you know, consider wildlife habitat and access to um, the wetlands there and the, the stream, the water source, um, I definitely think the fence needs to be outside of the 25. Um, and I still even have concern there. Um, so I just want to kind of bring that to your attention. Um, I also, you know, totally respect the land bank's position to find farmable parcels on Nantucket and to encourage small farmers. I have concerns though on properties like this one where there are so many wetland boundaries and a strong, a flowing stream, um, that it's maybe not the best choice for some of those farming activities. And I think that'll come out more in the, the farm plan probably. Um, but I, I definitely have concerns um, with a property with, again, wetlands that are this dynamic right on Pulpus Harbor. Um, 
just makes me nervous. Uh, Seth? All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just one more thing that I forgot to add um, that's relevant to this, this uh, conversation, but was brought up by Rachel about amending the, um, you know, the, our regulations to consider farming operations less than five acres. I, I personally don't agree with doing that. Um, I definitely support local farming. You know, I'm an avid gardener myself. I appreciate what the land bank is doing to provide access to farming. But I think that, you know, if they are looking to use smaller sites, they should probably choose sites that aren't constrained with wetland buffers um, where they exist. And we should keep the agricultural exemption at five acres uh, because wetland resource areas are so important and we do have to balance all of our interests. I understand that, but I don't want to sacrifice the regulatory status of our protected areas uh, when there's other farmable lands on Nantucket. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Uh, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like. No, so we'll open um, 19 while when it wrote up for public comment. Does not appear that we have, oh, um, Tom Dixon. Oh, you're muted. You're still muted. There we go. Please forgive me. Tom Dixon, 15 Walwinter Road, and I'm very excited about the land bank's um, work next door. And I just wanted to introduce myself to you, Ashley, and to your commission. And thank you very much for overseeing this and being so conscientious. I'd like to let anybody know that's concerned, wants a little more history, my wife, uh, MJ, and myself have been here for almost 40 years and have um, learned a lot and been a present for a lot of transition with 19 Wall Winnet Road. So if we can be of any assistance, and I'm assuming that if I have any question, Rachel is the go-to girl or woman. And uh, once again, I thank you for this opportunity. Sorry about the lighting. Uh, wrong time of day. But thank you again, um, Ashley, and I appreciate your attention to these matters and for the future. Thank you for participating. Um, Rachel, I see your hand up and then Mike, I see your hand just went up. Um, would Mike like to proceed me? Um, Mike, do you have a question that you're going to sure, actually just a, a comment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Um, you know, on the farm plan side, side, it sounds like there's enough concerns and um, excitement at the same time to uh, make it happen. I don't know if it's possible because of everybody's meeting constraints, but we might want to try to hash some things out before we do our, our regular meetings, if possible. That's just my only comment. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, do you mean just like with the land bank kind of thinking about this before a meeting? Yeah, um, you know, when the farm plan comes up, uh, you know, it's similar to we have uh, some outside meetings from time to time. This one seems like it could suck a lot of the wind out of the room in a regular meeting. Um, so just if it's possible, you know, perhaps we would explore that. Um, yes, we'll make sure it goes on an appropriate uh, agenda so that we can hear everything. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um, Rachel, go ahead. Um, thank you, Mike. I, I actually would, and this is a discussion that I can have with Will as well, but I would relish the opportunity to meet with the Conservation Commission to discuss the farm plan and to describe what we're doing agriculturally on the island and why we're doing the things we're doing, where we're doing them. Um, and I, I completely understand avoidance of wetland resource areas, 
it's it's not always as simplistic as that. We're we're often um, purchasing existing farms or farms that areas that have been historically farmed, and there's a cultural reference as well. Uh, most often. Uh, and this will not come as a surprise, the, and I think I've mentioned this before, the highly developable land is not what the land bank ends up purchasing. <laughs> um, it is occasionally the case, um, but we are often, we, you know, part of the reason that we are in here so often is because we do have so many wetland resource areas on our property and so many um, environmental components to what we do. Um, so I would, I would really relish the idea of having a meeting potentially where, where we could talk a lot about the research we've done with all the, all the agricultural, um, designations and, you know, what, what we're hoping for on the island and some of our areas of concern and some of our areas where we think we can do a good job, um, and, and be environmental stewards as well as, as you know, having small scale agriculture. That would that would be a really unique opportunity. That would be great if possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Mark. Oh, thank you, um, Rachel. If you could help me help me with one thing. I've read the application, and it sort of feels more like an RDA than an NOI. I don't, I'm not sure what you're specifically applying for. We are specifically applying for a hoop house um, permission to cover crop and a fence um, within, not within the 25 foot buffer, within the 25 to the 50 foot buffer. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Any other questions or comments from commissioners or the public? Uh, looks like no. Um, Will, would we have everything we would need to close? Yes, we do. Uh, Rachel, would you like to close? Yes, please. Is there a motion to close? Motion made by Mark. Is there a second? Seconded by Mike. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. I abstain. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. Williams. Oh, I forgot you're recused. Um, okay, so that carries with Commissioner Golding abstaining and Commissioner Williams recused. Uh, thank you, Rachel. Thank you very much. We look forward to hearing from you again um, with more plans. Yes, thank you. Um, and that brings us to Malm at 4 Cathcart Road, represented by Mark Ritz. Good evening, Mark Ritz from Site Design, representing the applicants at 4 Cathcart. Excuse um, me, Ms. Madam Chair, I have to recuse from this. This is an old client. All right, thank you, Linda. Uh, what you have before you this evening is a residential development of a property that has been uh, subdivided. Um, there was a wetland resource delineation done on this property about a year, year and a half ago, something like that. And uh, the property has been cleared up to the 100 foot buffer based on that delineation. Uh, the application before you tonight includes a portion of a swimming pool and patio within jurisdiction, a portion of a tennis court. Uh, two small buildings and a piece of another patio um, and a little bit of uh, landscaping and grading within jurisdictional areas as well. Um, approximately 86% of the 25 to 50 foot buffer will remain as undisturbed native vegetation. So well above the 50% requirement. Uh, all structures, pools, and other, you know, work is going to maintain uh, greater than two foot separation to, to high groundwater. Um, and, you know, basically uh, every, every structural component is outside of the, the 50 and all work is outside of the 25. Um, the limit of work is on the plan is depicted by the orange dashed uh, silt fence line. 
Um, and that's pretty much it. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mark. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. So we'll open up for Cathcart Road uh, for public comment. It does not appear that we have any public comment. Um, Will, do we have everything we would need to close? Yes, we do. Mark, would you like to close? Please. Is there a motion to close? Motion made by Mike. Is there a second? Seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. So that uh, carries with Commissioner Williams recused. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to amended orders of conditions. We have Johnson at 34 Easton Street, represented by Art Gasparo. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm before you tonight uh, with a request for an amended order of conditions to replace a pre-existing timber groin, um, which is licensed and is um, really rotten out. I included a photo as well so that you could see the condition of that, um, uh, of that structure. This order of conditions that we currently have uh, allows for the replacement of the um, of the dock uh, and pier, as you probably all recall that we've discussed a couple of times, and uh, that work is underway. And we would like to, at the same time, while mobilized, also uh, replace this groin. It allows us to be able to do the work uh, from the barge, from the water side, really minimizing the impact. The materials will be uh, grabbed onto, pulled pulled out, essentially extracted, um, put onto the barge, taken to be properly disposed of off-site, and then um, the new uh, timber would be um, driven in uh, with the vibratory hammer uh, on the end of the um, excavator operating from the barge, and then the work will be done, um, you know, in terms of the amount that's needed by hand labor uh, on the beach to rebolt the uh, whales onto the uh, timber groin. And uh, we're gonna maintain the same length and height that previously existed. I know there's been a lot of discussion with the commission uh, in the past few months about replacement of groins. We can go as far into that as you would like to. I don't wanna take, I think it's this, a lot of the same um, uh, positions in terms of this is, um, you know, really responsible maintenance as required by the chapter 91 permit uh, that these structures be maintained. And that's uh, exactly what we're trying to do here in a way that will not have an adverse impact on the um, interest protected by the commission. And with that, I'd be happy to address, uh, and, and as you all, I think are aware, this is on the inner Harbor along, uh, you know, Easton street um, where there is a whole series of timber grinds. Um, I'd be happy to address questions or concerns that you might have with the application. Thank you, Art. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll take a very short time uh, as it seems like our ability to you know, enforce the regulations on pre existing use structures is limited, um, unfortunately but I will request that we put this through the waiver requirement in order of conditions um, that relates to pre-existing use. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Seth. Uh, and I, I still do wish we could get a town council opinion on these structures. So I'll just throw that back in another public meeting uh, and maybe one day we'll get it. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Okay. Uh, Ian? Yes. Uh, why don't we uh, refuse to uh, consider any of these applications until we get an opinion from town council? 
It seems absolutely reasonable from my point of view. It's a reasonable request. And I don't know why it's been stonewalled for so long. Thank you. Um, thank you, Anne. I, I Would you like to address that, Will? Um, I, I believe we ha have to hear applications or they essentially get an automatic pass through if we don't hear them within 21 days. Um, so I think that would have some unfortunate consequences, although I understand um, the frustration with this. Well, thank you for being so tactful, Ashley. Yeah. Um, Linda, I see your hand up. I'm not probably going to be so tactful. You can't do that. You have to, as Ashley said, you have to accept applications that are put in there. It's None not of the applicant's fault. I'm, I'm, so I'm stop talking wasting our time by repeating. I'm talking, hey guys, I am talking, Ian. I didn't interrupt you. But it's not the applicant's fault if the town is remiss in providing us the uh, guidance that we've requested. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you, Linda. Um, and everybody, I mean, I, again, I'm I'm equally as frustrated that we don't get access to town council for important questions. So it's it's um, not right, is what I will say. Um, will um, just to address, since my name was called out, um, I'm happy to send another request to town council on this, which is about what I can do. Yeah, I mean, I think let's just kind of um, continue to hammer it with each application that we get, um, maybe until we get some sort of clear answer. Um, I appreciate you adding that to your long list, Will. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners? If not, I will open this up for public comment. Um, we have uh, Deanne Atherton, who just says she agrees with Commissioner Golding's request um, regarding the opinion of town council. Uh, the Conservation Commission must have access to town council. And she's asking how the public can help. Um, I, I am not sure what the most effective way for the public to help um, is, uh, but I believe this process is kind of set forth through the town manager. Um, so uh, I, I think she might be the best one to question or possibly someone in the natural resource office. Um, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to confirm through the amended order of conditions request process, we, we still have the ability to uh, apply the waivers with that. Is that true? I believe so. I don't know if that was to me or not. To anyone who can answer. Yeah, I believe we can add that. And Will is shaking his head yes. So we will add that. Um, all right, so if there aren't any other comments, um, Will, do we have everything we would need to issue the amended order and add the um, waiver criteria in? Yes, we do. Art, would you like us to issue tonight? Yes, please. Uh, is there a motion to issue the amended order? Motion made by Joe, seconded by Mike. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. Williams. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Thank you, Art. Thank you. Um, and it looks like we're moving on to one of your minor mods. So that moves us on to minor modifications. We have 16 Western Preservation LLC at 16 Western Avenue, represented by Art Gasparo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is an application um, that was related to residential redevelopment. And um, this is down um, past uh, to sort of to the west of uh, Surfside Beach. And there's a path down to the beach that's been used for for many many years. This was a quite an old house that was was replaced, and there were some um, uh, old uh, timbers in the um, in the path. It's uh, it's not in the resource area, but just outside of the 
border to the coastal dune in the buffer zone. And so um, the application is, you know, it is, um, this was just outside of the uh, approved work area. So we wanted to make sure that we came back to the commission um, before we, um, you know, they, they'd like to essentially replace those um, those timber steps uh, in that path, which again, it's only about four feet high or so. Um, so it's not, you know, a real significant type of a, um, of a bank. Um, it's really not a bank at all. I just guess I would, I would call it a slope. And by having the steps in there, I think that it is a benefit that it promotes the stability of the slope and from having uh, stormwater runoff, um, you know, gullying out uh, in that area. Thank you, Art. Um, are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Looks like no. Uh, Will, do we have everything we would need to issue the minor mod? Yes, we do. Art, would you like us to issue tonight? Yes, please. Is there a motion to issue the minor mod? Motion made by Joe. Is there a second? Seconded by Mark. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Klandowski. Aye. Williams. Aye. That carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, Art. And that moves us on to, I'm not sure if it's Zarcone or Zarconi at uh, 16 Cherry Street, represented by Paul Santos. I have to recuse my son as a direct butter. All right, thank you, Linda. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Paul Santos with Nantucket Surveyors on behalf of the applicant and property owner, Margaret Zarcone. Uh, this, this is a minor modification request um, for uh, an order of conditions that permitted construction of a pool with associated grading, landscaping, and utility installation within the buffer zone to an offsite isolated wetland. Uh, waivers were not required as part of the project as originally approved. In preparing the final as built for certificate of compliance request, um, the owner constructed a small five by seven foot shed along the north side of the existing dwelling a small portion of that shed ended up in the 100 foot buffer zone. So we're asking for a uh, minor modification to um, validate uh, the placement of that shed. The, we are also asking for a minor mod to validate the final landscape layout um, of the site, part of which was a uh, landscape retaining wall that was constructed outside of the 50 foot no build and then a small surround around the, uh, there's a bluestone patio around the existing um, 10 by 20 foot pool, which is outside of the 50 foot um, no build. Uh, that is the request. So the minor mod uh, was essentially more so filed to, to validate the, the section of the shed. And if you, if you look at the north side, you'll see the 100 foot buffer zone um, clipping the, the subtly portion of the five by seven shed that was constructed along the side of the house. Uh, that is the request. Um, if the commission sees fit to issue this minor modification, uh, the next application you have before you is a specific compliance for, um, for the closeout of this permit since all the work has been completed. And happy to answer any questions uh, that the board may have. Thank you, Paul. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? Um, looks like no. I, I have to admit, I always hate getting the minor mods after the fact. I know that it's probably something you didn't even know about until you went to get the certificate, Paul. Um, uh, but I, I wish people would just come ahead of time. <laughs> uh, yeah, the shed was a bit of a surprise when we came around the corner, so... Um, and I don't know, keep it outside of the hundred, but they were close. They just weren't close enough. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, all right. Will, do we have everything we would need to issue the minor mod? 
Yes, we do. Um, if there's no commissioner's comments or questions, would somebody like to make a motion to issue the minor mod? I move. Um, I think Joe got you and I'll give you the second, Seth. Uh, by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Harrisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. All right, that carries with Commissioner Williams recused. And that moves us on to certificate, certificates of compliance. We have Zarcone at 16 Cherry Street, represented by Paul Santos. Um, thank you again, Paul Santos, on behalf of Nantucket Surveyors for the property owner and applicant Margaret Zarcone. And uh, based on your uh, generosity of issuing a minor modification post work, uh, we are seeking to have you issue a certificate of compliance uh, for the subject property. Thank you, Paul. Are there any questions or comments from commissioners? If no, Will, have um, you been out to the site and can you confirm that we could issue the certificate of compliance? Yes, everything is as it appears on the plan. Uh, and are there any ongoing conditions? One moment. Uh, this one is a pool, so I would suspect there will be. Yeah, probably pool and lighting. It's going to uh, be pool and light. I just want to verify the numbers on the conditions, unless you have it up, Paul. <laughs> Yeah, it would be um, condition uh, 19, 20, 21, and 22. 19, pool shall be not be chemically treated November 1st, May 1st. All chemical treatment shall stop three weeks prior to any draining. Pool shall not be drained or discharged by, the pool shall be drained or discharged by truck to an area outside of commission jurisdiction. All lighting shall be directed downward or waste from the resource area. So that's conditions 19, 20, 21, and 22. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, if there aren't any questions from commissioners, would somebody like to make the motion to issue the cert with ongoing conditions 19 through 22? I think Mike made that motion. Joe, I'll give you the second. So by rule vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. Williams. Oh, you're recused. I'm, I'm, my brain is not working very well. All right, so that um, carries with Commissioner Williams recused. Um, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Uh, and that moves us on to our orders of conditions. Um, we'll send these out uh, earlier today and we'll begin with Sunset House LLC at 15 Hollowell Lane. Will, I think you're doing it, but are you gonna pull these up for everybody? Too many windows open, sorry. That's okay. Um, this is the PDF, but I would like to have the Word document open, but we can start talking about this. Um, all right, so we had our 18 and 19. This is from 15 Hallowell from last meeting. Um, all fueling shall take place greater than 50 feet from the resource area. Sedimentation shall be minimized with best measures in place to contain any sediment. Quarterly report shall be provi provided to the commission documenting the condition of the groin and bulkhead, the location of the resource areas and the location of mean high water. Should sand not accumulate for three consecutive surveys between the groins or adjacent to the groins as shown through the reporting, the applicant shall appear before the commission to discuss pot potential remedies of the system not functioning as designed. 23, prior to the start of the groin repair, the applicant shall submit a volumetric estimate of annual mitigation sand to be provided to the system. This information shall be submitted to the Conservation Commission for approval prior to the start of work. 24, 
The applicant shall provide a quarterly monitoring report to be reviewed by the commission for the area immediately west of the groin system, indicating how much sand has been placed for beach nourishment. 25, the applicant shall provide a quarterly monitoring report to be reviewed by the commission, indicating the volume of sand trapped by the groin system in comparison to the entrapment capacity of the system. The applicants shall provide photographs of the site documenting the amount of sand located in the groin system and on either side of the groin. The photograph shall include a date and time and an indication of what portion of the tide cycle the photos were taken. Should adverse impacts related to sand starvation be observed, additional action or mitigation may be required by the commission. And then here is the waiver section. I'm um, reading, but uh, any questions, comments, amendments from commissioners? Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. I think it's very close, but two minor things. Um, in number 20, when we start with sedimentation, can we just say sedimentation and erosion? Shall be minimized with the best measures in, to, in place to contain sediment and control erosion. And then in number 26, I'd like you to say should adverse impacts related to sand starvation be observed, the applicant will be required to appear before the commission to mitigate such impacts. Thank you, Seth. Anything else? Um, any other questions, comments, amendments from commissioners? Okay, it looks like no. Thank you, Will, for taking a closer look at this one for us. Um, if there's no other amendments or questions, would somebody like to make a motion to issue the order as amended? Uh, motion made by Mike. Is there a second? Seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Harrisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Mizzarelli? Aye. Landowski? Aye. Williams? Aye. That carries unanimously. And that moves us on to Boathouse Realty Trust at 52 Warren's Landing Road. All right, so this one I currently have the 18 and 19 and the waiver request. Is there anything additional we would like to see on this order? Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. Although they're moving in just an existing house rather than building a new house, I still think we should add the lighting conditions, please. Thank you for that suggestion. That's a, an important one. Um, well, we'll get in this copy and paste done. Uh, any <laughs> other uh, questions, comments, amendments, Ian? Yes, uh, they're removing the uh, concrete uh, uh, retaining wall, right? Isn't there a small concrete retaining wall there at the base of the... Am, am it, I imagining things? No, it is there, but they had requested to retain that wall. As um, a non-permitted? Uh, As a structure that predates the history of the Wetlands Protection Act. Okay. 
in the first hearing, I'd asked about it and they were not extremely interested in removing that. I recall that as well. All right. Um, any other questions, comments, or amendments? Or does anybody um, feel like the wall's a, a sticking point? Well, I don't like it, but I don't know what we can do about it at this point. If since the hearing is closed, um, and we can't through the order of conditions process require the removal of something that is is allowed under the pre-existing use, we would have to, you know, work with the applicant to get them to remove it. I would love it to be removed, but I think we are out of options at this point. Well, I guess my understanding was that it wasn't a bulkhead. It was just part of the initial construction. And so normally, you know, when a property is moved back, they um, they make a point of filling in or removing any of the foundation when they move it back. So I sort of was treating it in my mind's eye as a foundation. Well, it looks like this one has escaped us. So, um next time we'll have, <laughs> we'll have more discussion about about a situation like this um any other questions comments or amendments and if not would somebody like to make a motion to issue as amended uh motion made by seth is there a second seconded by mike yeah i'll make the motion but just one comment for clarification it is listed on the plan as a concrete retaining wall so whether it was part of the initial foundation or not, I'm not sure, but they have listed it as a separate structure. Right. So, so moved. Okay. Um, so motion made by Seth, seconded by Mike. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Mizzarelli? Aye. Landowski? Aye. Williams? Aye. That carries unanimously. And that moves us on to McLean at 100 Madakasham Valley Road. All right. Uh, so this one we had our 18 and 19, and then additional conditions 20. The applicant shall present a yearly report, including photographs demonstrating the condition and survivorship of the replanted area and the existing vegetated areas. Should the commission determine that additional plantings are necessary, they will be authorized based on this discussion. 21, all restoration plantings and seedings are to be native species with no cultivars. 22, the applicant shall present an NOI to the commission to appropriately replace the snow fencing. Um, I've also added a an additional finding in here. I'm not sure if this wording is exactly how we want it, but the commission finds that the existing rollout snow fencing is not ideal for this site, and therefore its presence is not covered by this order. Um, Seth? Thank you. I think we need to say not approved by the order rather than covered. And I think in permit overview, we also need to say because it right now says order permits the beach stairs and snow drift fencing. Yep. So just end at beach stairs and say the snow drift fencing is not approved or just take it out. I think the finding covers it if we take that out of there. Yeah, I agree. Um, any other questions, comments, amendments? All right, if there are no amendments or questions, uh, would somebody like to make a motion to issue as amended? Motion made by Mike, is there a second? Yeah. Uh, seconded by Ian, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Aye, excuse me. Mazzarelli? Aye. Landowski? Aye. Williams? Aye. 
Great, that carries unanimously. And that moves us on to Nantucket Islands Land Bank at the South Shore Beach or beaches. All right. For this one, we've got 18 to 19 and then 20. The stairs shall be removed seasonally and as needed prior to significant storm conditions. And 21, signage shall be provided directing beachgoers to the location of the access stairs. Thank you, Will. Uh, Seth, I see your hand up. Yes, in 20, can we just add the stairs shall be removed seasonally and or something about and not stored in the resource area or buffer zone? Or no stairs should be stored in resource areas or buffer zones. Should we say re removed and stored off site? Sure. Like out of jurisdiction. That's better wording. Or I'll say uh, the store, the stairs shall be removed and stored out of commission jurisdiction. Sure. Thank you, Will. Uh, any other questions, comments, amendments? Looks like no. So would somebody like to make a motion to issue as amended? Motion made by Mike, seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Mizzarelli? Aye. Landowski? Aye. Williams? Aye. That carries unanimously. And that moves us on to Nantucket Islands Land Bank at 261 Hummock Pond Road. Um, so this was the black pine removals at the end of Mothball Hummock Pond. Um, we had all work shall be performed in accordance with the site and work description contained within the notice of intent and plan notes set out on the plan of record provided project narratives and protocols and 19 refueling of equipment must take place outside of the resource areas. Thank you, Will. Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. I know these are dead pine trees, but it's still good to put this in since they are all Japanese black pine or most of Japanese black pine, in my opinion, if they accidentally get any uh, cones in there that are still viable, um, those should be, you know, put into the invasive waste stream at the landfill or, you know, appropriately disposed of. Thank you, Seth. We definitely don't need to spread more of those pines around. Um, just a question. Are, are we suggesting a condition that they pick up excess cones on the ground? Or I'm assuming all this stuff's going to be chipped. I don't think they need to pick up excess cones okay. on the ground. I mean, it would be great if they will, but um, I don't think that's within the scope of the order. I think we're right. just saying that all, uh, all cut and chipped um, debris is removed offsite and disposed of at the Madikit landfill or um, otherwise appropriately. There's a condition in there in your master list somewhere, probably similar to that. Well, while Will is looking for that, does anybody else have any uh, questions, comments, or amendments for this one?
we say uh, just shall be properly disposed of and end it there or properly disposed of at the Madigate landfill. Maybe say through like the invasive species. Um, it's going to be too much for the dumpster. Yeah, um, this came up in the, another project because like, you know, Japanese black pine is not a traditional invasive because you have a lot of wood chips. I think we ended up saying to just shall be treated as an invasive species and properly disposed of as such. Thank you guys. All right. Um, so if there are no other questions, comments, or amendments, would somebody like to make a motion to issue as amended? Motion made by Mark, seconded by Ian. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. Williams. Aye. All right, that carries unanimously. Uh, and that moves us on to Nantucket Islands Land Bank at 21 and 27 Sackage Road. All right. I have 18 and 19, and I know that we're going to be adding stuff to this. Or maybe. Maybe, yes, maybe no. Maybe no. I'm Any? still having trouble with this one. Um, Joe? Would it make any sense to have something that says split rail fence post, just the post, placed four feet apart on the entrance to Miss Benedictus's property and force the boats to take the other route? People could take that route 21 or 20, whatever that is, 27, 21. And not boats. That would be for them to work out with, with her. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. If I would be opposed to, to that. If Am I interrupting you, Joe? No. no. Um, through you, Madam Chair, I, I would be opposed to that because I, I like the idea of keeping it as natural looking as possible. Um, I certainly <clears throat> sympathize with... Uh, the about her, and um, and I think it's very unfortunate that I that we listen to that litany of bad behavior. I'm sure there's also very good behavior as well, mostly by the neighbors who use it. But um, I I wouldn't be in favor of keeping it as natural looking as possible. And if the land bank decided that they wanted to come back. To modify it, then you know, after discussions with the about her, then they can. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ian. I would have to agree with you there that I think the land bank and the property owner should decide between them if if they feel like buffer plantings or fencing is needed, and then they can come back with the minor mod. Um, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. And for reference, and it's in the photos as well. I mean, there already is split rail fencing that is on both sides of the path. Um, probably not as, as skinny as four feet. Um, but I think if any extension to this split rail fencing needed to happen, it would be no, no different aesthetically than already exists on site. I, I don't really know if that's in our purview to say exactly how wide the opening should be. Thank you, Seth. And I do, you know, it's unfortunate to hear about the public behaving badly in this way. And I, I do think it speaks to more public education being needed. It sounds like these are some like extreme rogue individuals, but just in general, when we're accessing, you know, public open space, um, kind of how to respect that space and the resource areas again probably needs to be better um, spread around the island um, as far as information goes. I think you're right, actually. It's much more intense use these days. 
Yeah, and that, I mean, it's been well documented, especially since COVID, um, more public use of open space and people really not being aware of how to appropriately treat that space. Uh, and with the land bank having so many land holdings, um, you know, they can't be everywhere at once. So, um, Seth? So this is gonna get into another one of my favorite topics, but it's our role in open space preservation, which I know we've spent less effort and time on in the past, but we have complete authority to um, do any education, outreach, signage, et cetera, that uh, benefits better use of open space. And in conditions like this, I think, um, you know, working with the applicant to have appropriate uh, outreach and signage is great too, but I would even like urge us to say, you know, this, this path has received a order of conditions from the Conservation Commission. Please be respect, or this is a fragile environment. Please be respectful of it and put up our own sign there. Um, and we have the ability to do that. And I think, you know, I know there's a concern about over signing and I know there's, there's the reality because I deal with it in my work that there are some people who are never going to follow signs, no matter what they say, uh, it could say, uh, you'll be shot on site and people will still walk past it. But I think it gives it a little bit more legitimacy if, you know, we show this is not only just one in one organization who's coming forward, but this is something that's been reviewed and assessed by a town body. And I think it's it, it makes it more legitimate for the public. Um, thank you for that suggestion, Seth. And I think that also gives some more teeth. I mean, if the police get called out to the site and have to um, deal with individuals there, we could bring those individuals in for an enforcement through our process if they're behaving poorly uh, and that gives a little bit more notification. So um, I appreciate that. Mark, I saw your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the, the problems are on the road uh, and, the, and crowding. There's a big demand for parking places there. But also I think if you're taking down your beach chairs or your boat overhead, say a canoe overhead with two people or even one if you're smart, uh, strong, um, they're going to stay on the path. Um, if you go off that path, you're in uh, rose hips, you're in scrub oak, you're in nasty bushes. So I don't think we need more signs on the path, maybe on the roadside, which is DPW or land bank. But uh, I don't think, uh, I wouldn't be in favor of having a conservation commission sign saying behave yourself. Um, thank you, Mark. And um, I know that we had kind of tabled the open space discussion for like more information on some of our property holdings, but I, I, um, I know this is a topic that will be brought up, um, you know, sometime this spring. Um, Seth? Yeah, and especially because we're working with um, the land bank in this case, there might be a little bit more flexibility than with the private homeowner where you know, maybe they would let us review their language of their signage and have some suggestions prior to them posting it. I think it gives them legitimacy too, that if, you know, the sign says this has gone through an official process and there are, there's bad behavior that relieves some of the enforcement and having to deal with issues on their end too. And, you know, we're trying to help. I, nobody wants to nobody wants to ruin the aesthetic view of the location by having a hundred signs, but no one also wants to allow bad behavior. So I think we should maybe see if the land bank would uh, work with us on that. Um, thank you, Seth. Maybe that should go in in findings. Um, I respectfully disagree because um, I, I know I'm just I'm just throwing out my idea, Ian, and then Mike has his hand up, and then we'll we'll go to you. I apologize for interrupting. Yeah, I, I I'm just thinking of where that could go. I mean, we all have to to vote on it, but you know, it might be appropriate there. Um, Mike, go ahead. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to say um, the land bank has always showed cooperation with signage. So um, could we just put our signage clause in there and, and work with them on some more? And you know, to Ian's point, there's a lot of good behavior too, but good behavior just doesn't get recognized and commended. It's always bad behavior that gets pointed out. Um, definitely something to consider. Thank you, Mike, because um, that the land bank has worked with us on signage before. Um, Ian, go ahead. Well, thank you, Ashley. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, this has been a contentious issue in Quidnet. So um, I think that if you spoke to people in Quidnet, you would get a broader picture of what's taken place there in the past. And um, so uh, I think especially since we depend on goodwill as a commission, really, for people to behave appropriately and let us know when there have been infringements. I would rather that we were in the background on this and that the land bank, um, if, if there were any signs to be put up that the land bank would put them up. Uh, that, that is just my personal opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Uh, any other questions, comments, <coughs> amendments? Um, you know, I'm, I'm fine either way, putting in, you know, additional findings, something about the, the potential benefit of a sign. Um, so I guess we can leave that to, to majority, um, on, on what people think. Um, does anybody else have an opinion whether that should be in findings or not? Uh, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, I would like to see that. Um, the additional findings is somewhat non-binding non anyways, but it signals, uh, it it codifies the conversation that's happened here and signals to the permit holder what the intent is. Uh, thank you, Seth. Uh, Linda? I'm on, I'm on with Seth, what he's saying. Um, I'm still concerned. I still don't see the point and I still don't know how I'm going to vote, but if we're going to put something in findings, then we really should have it very, very detailed as to what we're putting into findings on this on this particular subject. Okay, um, I know, like in the past, I've put like um, or re requested like for wildlife habitat, you know, recognizing this site as wildlife habitat, or you know, things like that. So. Um, because it is non-binding, um, I think we've tended to be maybe a little looser with um, the statement, uh, but I'm up for wording it anyway. Any other commissioners uh, wanna weigh in? I think, um, or are the four that aren't speaking against having that as an additional finding? Uh, I, I, I was happy with just, you know, recognizing the signage clause, but um, I'm kind of fine with, with it being an additional findings, whatever you really want to put in there. Okay. Um, Mark Beal, I saw your hand up. Yeah, so I was just going to suggest the, the finding referred to the land bank putting appropriate signage up. I don't think it's quite the best for us. The landowner should be the one that's saying, please stay on the path and respect the property and that sort of thing. Yeah, so I think we could say the commission finds um, there may be benefit to signage for the public um, indicating proper use of this site. Yeah, perfect. Very good. Uh, Um, all right, anything else on this one? And if, uh, Seth? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So there's still the discussion uh, that 
was brought about in the notice of intent section about whether having the the two access points, the one at 21 and one at 27, is the right thing to do or consolidating the access points. I think we do need to discuss that here. And I think we do need to go through not only, oh, definitely not personal feelings because I have my own, but we need to look at, you know, the specifics of these um, these proposed um, uses because, you know, they are considered water dependent uses. So they have a little bit of different treatment than, um, than some other things. Although I don't really like personally agree with the use of the two access points. I'm not sure from a regulatory perspective if there's enough overwhelming information to deny the access point on that behalf and then allow the other one to continue. It seems a little bit arbitrary. So um, if the applicant is unwilling to you know, do that on their own end, which it seems like they are not willing. Okay, uh, Jesus Christ. I am somewhat, uh, I guess, at the point where we just need to go forward. Um, it, Ian, yep, I see your hand. Yeah, I can't believe my ears. There's been a path there long before there was a house there. When I was a teenager in the 60s, I used to park there with Betsy Reed and we'd go down there at night and then go off along the beach. You know, it's been there for a very long time. So I'm sort of speechless at this, you know, trying to sort of close it after the application has been through. I, I thank mean, you. I, thank you, Ian. I, I see Seth's point. I think initially I, I would have thought consolidating the two paths would be the way to go to have an intact buffer, you know, along more of that, um, the road. Uh, and using kind of the more extended pathway that's now going to have some significant um, alterations with a path. Um, but I, I think given the information presented tonight, the amendments they're going to do to the stormwater movement in that area, and the fact that it seems like this is a historic use, I, I would not be for closing the path at this point. Um, but I, I you know, I do want to allow everybody to be able to make their points, um, you know, at, at, at our meetings. So, um, Mike? Um, just as I stated earlier, that I'm, I'm in favor of keeping both accesses of the paths, um, respectful to everybody's comments um, for, for beach access. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Joe? I'd go for leaving both open because that's what the land bank wants. And they have some strong arguments for it. Okay, thank you, Joe. Um, anybody else? I'm seeing a thumbs up from Mark. Um, so if there's not further discussion or any kind of questions, comments, or amendments anybody thinks necessary, uh, would somebody like to make a motion to issue as amended. Uh, motion made by Mark, seconded by Joe. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. Williams. Um, Linda, you're muted. Having her ice cream. No, I'm a lactose intolerant person. <laughs> um, I'm going to abstain. Okay. Um, so that carries with Commissioner Williams abstaining. Um, and that moves us to Nantucket Islands Land Bank at 19 Walwinet Road. <clears throat> All right. Um. I have a feeling we may be adding to this as well, but the 
18 and 19 and then 20 no livestock will be kept on the property um 21 all water sampling reports and soil testing as described in the noi are to be submitted to staff for review well you know you've stopped the screen share oh nope i don't know that i stopped the screen share thanks for letting me know you're welcome uh here is that uh but we have our 18 and 19 and then i added 20 and 21 um no livestock will be kept on the property and all water sampling reports and soil testing as described in the NOI are to be submitted to staff for review. And Will, I feel like we need to amend the permit overview because we're like at this point, we've been told we're getting a farm plan. So they were very specific about the hoop house, the fence, and then my brain is escaping right. me on the third thing. Yeah, that's where I was. Cover, cover crops. Cover. Yeah, cover cropping, hoop house. Uh, All right, well, it was a hoop house. <laughs> um, eight foot fence. The eight foot fencing. And then the cover crops. Uh, and then, Mark, when Will's done typing, I'll go to you. Go ahead. Well, I just had a question, and Will can begin detyping away. Um, is a hoop house a permanent structure? Uh, essentially, it's like a, a greenhouse type structure. Yeah, I know what it, I know what it is, but I didn't know if that's considered permanent. I wouldn't consider it permanent. It doesn't. Typically, they're just put together with poles that go into the ground and are braced by wood, but I'm not exactly sure of the construction of this one. It's going to be a windy site. Yeah, they'll have to recover that a bunch. I mean, we would consider it structural, certainly, with the metal, like all the different um, structural components in there. Um, I mean, I always yeah. kind of considered them permanent, but knowing that you need to recover the plastic and they just take a lot of maintenance and upkeep. That's a good question though. Um, I think the issue will come down to, oh, excuse me, Ashley, go ahead. Um, no, I thought I saw Seth Pan going up, but um, I'll go to Seth and then go back to you, Mark. No, go to Mark first. Okay, Mark, go ahead. No, I, I mean, I'm looking forward to the farm plan. That's gonna be where we got the, the rubber meets the road with the farm plan. Yeah, this is pretty easy for the fence and the, cover crop and a hoop. Um, yes, I would agree. Uh, Seth, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think we should add that um, a condition indicating that um, all fencing and agricultural activities shall occur outside of the 25 foot buffer zone line. Yes, thank you for that one. And then just related to the hoop house, I think it's outside the 50s. So although it's a structure, it's in an area where structure is allowed. Seth, I might've just conflated like two sentences. You said all agricultural activities shall take place out of the 25 foot buffer zone, right? Um, Yes, all agricultural activities and the proposed uh, deer fencing, all, all fencing and agricultural activities. And then is this, just while um, Will is typing, is this where we would discuss them coming back with a farm plan or they're going to do that anyways? Um. I think they're going to do that anyways, but maybe we put that in the permit overview that this does not um, permit, you know, any other farming activities that a, um, a plan will need to be filed. Don't use that language, though, because it was poorly worded. <laughs> I got you.
competition. Uh, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I know what the cover crops they propose, they're like mostly things that are nitrogen fixing for the reason to not have to use fertilizer, but maybe we can just call out that no fertilizer should, should be used, um, at least in this phase, if there's a reason for in the farm plan that, you know, is reviewed and accepted by us, it's fine, but probably not in this phase. Thank you. That's a good idea. Any other questions, comments, or amendments on this one? It is a really cool property. So I think once they figure out how to farm within these wetlands, it's gonna be a pretty amazing um, spot. Absolutely. Um, if there's no uh, further amendments or questions. Yeah, so, sorry, Madam Chair, is Will gonna add the bit about the fertilizer? Oh. Oh, God. Thank you, Seth. No fertilizer or agricultural chemicals are allowed by this order. All right. It's only 7.30, but I'm fading fast. Um, I'll make a motion then. All right. <laughs> A motion to issue as amended. Yep. Perfect. Is there a second? Seconded Aye. by Mike. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Zarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. That carries with Commissioner Williams recused. I remember at that time. Uh, and that moves us on to Malm at 4 Cathcart Road. All right, and I'm sharing my screen. Uh, so we have 18 and 19 for this one, and then additional conditions, the pool conditions. Um, pools should not be drained or discharged into an area within the commission's jurisdiction. Pools should not be chemically treated between November 1st and May 1st. All chemical treatments shall stop three weeks prior to any draining or discharging of the pools. The applicant shall provide the contact information for the company maintaining the pools. The pool company shall provide 48 hour notice of any draining to the commission with a plan showing where the pool shall be drained to. And 24, all exterior lighting shall be directed away from the resource area and in compliance with chapter 102 of the code of the town of Nantucket. Thank you, Will. Uh, Mark? Didn't we discuss at one point having pools that were within our jurisdiction be drained to the, uh, the sewage plant? Um, I, recall that, I recall that topic at one point. We did talk about them being um, like pumped into a truck and discharged off site. Yeah. Yeah. So um, maybe on very sensitive areas, we should encourage that or require it. Yeah. Do we want to a pool turd like in the thousands of gallons. I don't know what a truck capacity would hold. Um, I didn't, I'm, I'm, 1,500 I mean, gallons is pretty how, that, how that could be, is, is there anybody that could actually do that? I know you can truck water in. Yeah, I believe we do have entities that can do that. Um, Seth? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I know there's at least a few orders that we've issued historically that had that condition and so far, no one's come to us and said that they've had a problem with it. So there must be a way that they figured it out. Um, so hopefully, yeah, hopefully, yeah. or they or they're just do it. doing it wrong and not saying anything. But um, that that condition does exist on active orders. And it might also be worth a conversation with David Gray at some point about like the capacity of the sewage treatment plant, given mm -hmm. the number of pools, you know, just kind of thinking about pools. 
mm -hmm. um, and their discharge in general. Do we but want to leave these them. as is? Sorry, if I just walk um, over someone. So Ian, I see your hand up and then Mike, I'll go to you. Yeah, so looking at the topography of this pool, um, if they pumped it anywhere, it would be uh, running downhill. So I would have thought this would be a classic example when we would uh, add a condition saying that they would have to truck it uh, off site. But, um, but then of course, I suppose Seth uh, will point out advisedly that, you know, most of it is outside our jurisdiction, even if it will end up being within our jurisdiction. So I'm not sure what we can do in this situation. I said that respectfully, Seth, I can assure you. <laughs> no, we, we have full authority. We have full authority to uh, indicate that the water should be pumped into a truck and, and brought off site um, as long as, you know, part of that pool is in the 100 foot buffer. If if none of the pools in the 100 foot buffer, then we are limited in scope, but we have full authority to add that condition here. Yeah, I mean, maybe we say something like, given the topography of the landscape, um, any water discharge from the pool needs to be removed um, offsite out of jurisdiction. Yeah, half of the pool is within the 100, according to the site plan. There's two pools. Ah, good point. <laughs> uh, and the second one is right on the edge. Yeah. Um, so, so. Then Mike, had you had your hand up? No, I, I was just saying, I, I was saying that, you know, pools typically aren't pumped all the way down after I made that. Uh, you know, they, they just take a portion of the water out. Yeah, I think we've only seen the true, like, fully drainage when they're having a problem with the structural integrity of the pool. <laughs> um, any other uh, questions, comments, amendments? And I, I know Will's still working on the um, pool drainage condition. I would be interested to hear what David Gray has to say about it, if they would find that overwhelming or be happy to see it. Uh, it, it just, um, I, I personally learn a little more on the subject. No, I agree. It just speaks to the, the lack of pool regulations in general on Nantucket and what the best way to manage them is. Um, And here's a guy building two pools on his property. Uh, how do we feel about the wording of condition 20? Um, how do people feel about that? Given the topography of the site, any pool draining that needs to take place shall be pumped to a truck and disposed of properly at the sewage treatment facility. I, I'm all for it. If uh... yeah, I'm I'm um, happy with that. Um, so if everybody is happy with the order, no questions or amendments, would somebody like to make a motion to issue as amended? Sure. Motion made by Ian. Is there a second? I'll second. Seconded by Mark. So by roll vote, Beal. Aye. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. All right. So that carries with Commissioner Williams recused. Uh, we don't have any extensions of orders this evening. So that brings us to other business. Uh, we have discussion of four Harbor Square, Straight Wharf Fish Market. 
uh, D. Benedictus and Barnacle email slash letters. Um, yes, I want to um, start and just see if any commissioners have questions about um, the letters or, or correspondence. Um, and if not, I do just want to remind everybody that um, the Conservation Commission hears wetland jurisdiction issues and to keep any um, kind of comments, questions, concerns to uh, the Wetlands Protection Act and our by bylaw, uh, which is the only thing under our, our purview about this site. Um, so I am not sure. Uh, Jeff, do you maybe want to Give us a little background. Sorry to put you on the spot right when you got on. Sure, well, that's why I'm here. If my computer wanted to work, sorry, I thought I froze up there for a second. So obviously, this is a project that we um, took through permitting some time ago now. Okay. That has been kind of in various states of of construction. I think current conditions right now is you you can go down there and. It looks a little bit like a, a roof in place while they're doing the renovation. Um, you know, we had kind of looked into the order of conditions and everything that was there. And the permit overview calls for a renovation. Sorry, I'm trying to bring it up as quickly as I can to um, a renovate, <clears throat> excuse me, a uh, renovation of the existing structure um, kind of adjacent to that bulkhead and within land something to close to storm flowage. Um, I think we felt that when it first came up, that reviewing the structure is, you know, renovation is admittedly a little bit vague, but given the non-expansion of footprint, we didn't really flag it for, for anything out of the ordinary. Um, I think there's some disagreement to that from, from the abutters, and I think there's some disagreement to that for uh, the folks running the project. Um, I think from our end, you know, I, I think, you know, kind of staff recommendation, if it looks like there needs to be something addressed, given the scope of the project being the, the renovation and repair of that structure, um, some clarification may be able to be done through a, a plan change or minor modification. But beyond there, I, I wouldn't anticipate um, any really excessive action needed given the, the state of the site. Okay. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, again, any questions or comments from commissioners at this point? Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. To staff, um, since I have not been to the site recently, um, when you did your site visit, was there any extension of structural area or uh, uses that aren't, aren't on the plan that would require a a plan change or was it as noted on the plan and the notice of intent? No, the, the building from, from our assessment seems to be maintaining the original um, exterior footprint. And then Jeff, I did just have one question about the um, supplemental letter from Katie Barnacle just regarding the um, kind of integrity of, um, not the basement, but um, I'm like losing my wording tonight, um, the foundation. Um, did that only come through the office or did we see that in front of the commission? Uh, I think, you know, my apologies, that came through the office after all of the hearing process had, had closed out um, to kind of clarify and keep us in the loop for all of the work that was going on and some of the work that had been unearthed during the renovation process. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so at this point, um, I'm, I'm not sure which party would like to go. I know we have individuals that um, have concerns about this site. Uh, we also have the um, applicant, so I guess, um, or the permit holder, I should say. Um, so I'm not sure if the permit holder would like to um, address some of the concerns. 
Um, and then um, we will go from there. Hi, this is Katie Barnacle. I'm sorry my uh, video for some reason is not working, so I apologize for that. We're just here to monitor and answer any questions, so I don't have anything. I think all our um, uh, submittals and letters uh, speak for themselves, so thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so any uh, questions or, or comments from um, kind of the abutting parties or their representatives? I represent the abutters, Danielle DiBenedictus. It's not true that the footprint is not being expanded. There's 147 foot proposed expansion to add a walk-in cooler that's the size of a garage. And that is not within the original footprint. I have the building department plans, which shows that the lobster tanks that were there when it was a fish store were inside the building. This is an additional 170 foot, one, excuse me, 147 foot structure. And I think, you know, for people to think about it, that is the basic size of a garage. This is a huge addition and it was not represented as such. And I think what you really have to look at is there was only one order of conditions issued and that was on an application to you, which is at page 37 of the package that everybody has in front of them. And that described the work as involving reshingling and painting, as well as making the entryways handicap accessible. And work proposed includes maintenance, repair, and interior restaurant improvements. That is the only order of condition that's ever issued for this project. And with respect to the application for that, um, order of condition, they're saying they're going to spend $7,900. Then they go into the building department and seek a permit from the building department to spend $1,275,000. I do want to focus us again on the wetlands issues and where you think the violations might take place. Well, I, I think that anything that is being constructed within the wetlands area that's the size of a garage uh, need, needs to have an amended order of conditions. And they haven't even requested an amended order of condition. When, when they went in with this letter, which is apparent that nobody is on, on the board here has even read uh, or even seen, it wasn't even given it to them. And the supplemental letter does not conform with the required permitting process. The required permitting process was to issue um, an amended order of condition to ask for one. They've never brought this to you in, in any form whatsoever. There's been all the walls of the structure have been completely demolished and removed. And you can see that at page 366 of the proposal. Heavy equipment was used to remove debris and also at page 366. There was significant equipment mobilization to lift and support the roof of the structure. There was excavation outside of the building permit. And, and new and exterior re, interior foundations, complete new framing of walls. I've sent you pictures of all of this. None of this has been considered by you. And, and when Ms. Barnacle came before you, and at that time, Commissioner Williams, who was present in this matter, um, said that she was concerned that there would be necessary foundation work. And if you want to review those minutes, Ms. Barnacle replied that they would be back for an amended order uh, if such work took place. Well, they never went back for an amended order and the work did take place. <coughs> and, and it, it's, it's apparent that they've completely violated the permitting process. Um, th thank you. Um, Gabriel? Uh, hi, thank you. Um, so this gets a little complicated. My name is Gabriel Frasca. I am uh, representing Straight Wharf Fish Market. This gets a little complicated because some of this work um, comes under our, our landlord um, and some of this work is being done by us. The, uh, the foundational repair work is being done by the landlord. And, and to clarify, it's not that we found trouble with the foundation. It's that we found no foundation. 
um, quite literally. The two buildings were stuck in the mud on, on railroad ties. Uh, anyway, be that as it may, um, I just want to clarify that to the inch, um, the building is occupying the same exact footprint. That includes two corners that are out of true. We did not put them at 90 degree angles um, as we would have liked to when, when, when putting the building back. We left them, um, we left a slight trapezoid because that's what the, the previous footprint was. Um, Ms. De Benedictus is partially correct in, in saying that the lobster tanks were inside. Yes, there were three lobster tanks inside. There also were two lobster tanks outside on that 10 by 14 slab, um, which we have recreated or will recreate again to the inch. There's no expansion of the concrete slab. It is precisely the same. Instead of putting lobster tanks there because we don't have enough room, um, we, we wanna put a walk in there. Um, but beyond that, um, I, I just, um, I, I know that a lot of points were, were raised, some of which are, are, are germane to the conversation, some which are not. I don't wanna waste everyone's time um, by going through them one by one, but um, the building will be the precise same footprint and uh, the proposed walking out back will occupy the exact same space as the lobster tanks. In fact, and we have photos of this, one of the lobster tanks was over the concrete slab. Um, the walk-in will not be, it'll be within the concrete slab. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from commissioners at this point? May I speak at some point, Ms. Erisman? I can't figure out how to put my hand up, sorry. Um, Yes, Sarah, go ahead. So I represent the Old North Wharf um, Cooperative. I would echo a lot of what um, Ms. DeBenedict has said. The scope of this work so far exceeded what was presented to the commission. It's, it's kind of shocking to me, quite honestly. I, I think if any other applicant took a, an order of conditions that was granted in this six minute hearing, for shingling minor exterior work, mostly interior work, some work on some doors, um, some painting, and then went forward and took out all of the walls, did excavation work, new concrete, expanded the pad, the plans, well, the plans are, are really lacking. They're not at the standard that you normally would, would require, but, when you look at the plans there, some of the plans show this um, concrete work, some of it doesn't, some of it shows the um, where this cooler is going, other plans don't. But given what I've seen, there's a significant expansion of land that's being covered. And this is all land subject um, to coastal storm flowage and they're not supposed to do anything that would ne negatively impact the ability of the land to absorb floodwaters. And I, I, I don't see how you can say that they're not doing that. And to do it without the commission ever even having the opportunity to take a look at it um, is kind of crazy. They've added the structural slab, the helical piles, they elevated the building while they brought in this heavy equipment. They dug up um, from Straight Wharf across to Old North Wharf. They dug a trench, put in water service. None of that was permitted. None of that was shown to the commission. And I know that um, Mr. Benedict has put in quite a few pictures that would be helpful. Um, I think if you could maybe share those pictures, just so you could, I'm not sure if you've seen them all, but there was excavation done outside of the outside of the building footprint. Um, the entire inside of the building was open to the ground. There were no erosion control measures put in place. I mean, really nothing. So, I mean, a lot of this is sort of water over the bridge. Um, I, I just, it's hard when you come before the commission and try to do the right thing all the time to see an applicant just kind of flout their ability to just do this work, it, I find it kind of shocking. Anyway, I think you should issue a cease and desist until they come back in 
with an amended order. Um, if you listen to the six minutes of the hearing, they said that if they had to do all of this work, they would come back for an amended order. I think you should hold them to that and that they should have to come back in and do the amended order. Thank you. And I would really appreciate it if you would show those pictures. I echo showing the pictures. I think anybody who has any question about what's actually happened here would change their mind if they saw the pictures. Um, I, I know they're publicly av available, but Will, do you maybe want to bring up the pictures in question? Um, Mark Beal. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Sarah Alger was pretty clear on who she represents. I'm not sure who Danielle Denebeck just represents. Could she tell us who it is? I represent Charles Johnson. Thank and you. a father who's within 18 inches of the project. No, thank you. You just didn't say who it was. Thank you. I didn't catch that. Um, you can see his house 18 inches away from the project in the picture that's just been brought up. And I should really amend that to say I represent his wife as well, Ann Johnson. Can you can see all the heavy equipment in these pictures? This was described in order of conditions issued to do shingling worth seven thousand dollars, and then all this work was done. Wait, go go oh, back, so go back. See right there. See all that new cement and concrete work on the ground, and all the excavation that's been done. Yep. So um, again, we will, the commissioners will discuss this um, and take all of this into account once we've heard from all parties. Um, and thank you for bringing up the pictures, Will. Um, I'd also like to point out in that the only plan, a plan that was stamped by Paul Santos, uh, the slab is not as large as what they're intending to put in. Okay, so um, thank you. I want to make sure I, we've, we've had a few individuals with their hands up that I allow them to speak to. And then I, I think the commission will probably want to discuss um, kind of what we've heard from both sides. Um, Gabriel, I'll go back to you. Uh, thank you kindly, Madam Chairman. Uh, just briefly, the trenching that Ms. Benedictus mentioned to bring water over, um, that had nothing to do with, with our project. That is to bring um, uh, sprinkler systems to two restaurants. There was an easement granted. Um, this is my understanding, um, an easement granted. Um, it's the only way to get sprinkler systems to two buildings, one of which is, I've heard, 18 inches away from Ms. Benedictus. Miss the Benedictus client's uh, property. So I would imagine he would want it to be sprinkled. Um, anyway, back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rick Bodette. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Rick Bodette, I represent Nantucket Island Resorts, the property owner here. Um, and uh, you know, I, I've kind of heard from everyone here and uh, we, we don't have a lot to say other than, um, uh, you know, to sort of echo what Gabriel said, which is that, you know, that we, we were issued, came in to get a, an order of conditions. We were issued an order of conditions for a renovation. That's exactly what happened. And uh, and obviously Katie notified uh, staff when uh, the scope um included uh, replacing the foundation as soon as we knew it. And so that became apparent um, during the process. Um, but just to be clear, there is no expansion of the footprint um, that would require a chapter 91 review. Um, and, and that's not, ha hasn't happened. There's no expansion of the building. Um, it's uh, it's gonna be the exact same building in the exact same place. Um, so uh, and and you know I, I I have to take issue with the insinuation that we're you know came to you and we're we're hiding something and we gave you a light order of conditions and um, I've been here a long time I've represented this owner for fifteen years um, 
I've never been in front of the commission on an enforcement order. Uh, we just replaced both bulkheads for the entire boat basin. Um, and we came right to you guys. Um, if we knew we were going to uh, change the foundation, we would have just asked for it. These, this applicant, this owner is not afraid to come to you and, and seek permits. So um, that's one of the, the great benefits for me in representing them is that um, they do things right. So there was nothing hidden here. Um, and just to reiterate, that water line has nothing to do with this project. Um, we may sprinkle it. Um, we may not. Uh, it's not necessary to sprinkle it to open this building. Um, and and frankly, that that the town of Nantucket pulled the permit for that water line. They asked us, the fire department asked us um, uh, to help with uh, uh, connecting to their the town's own water line in Old North Ward. So, um, you know, if, if if anything's required in that respect, I think it's the the town that will be applying for it. So. Um, Anyway, I, I appreciate you guys letting the talk, and um, and uh, and and again, we we just want to reiterate that uh, we have all the permits we, we need for this for this building. Thanks a bunch. Thank you. I would like to reiterate that one of the permits that they okay. So, Mr. De Benedict, just please raise your hand and wait to be. Oh, I'm sorry. How do I do that? Any, any, uh, I'll, I'll recognize you. I just want to make sure commissioners don't have any questions or comments at this point. Um, Seth. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I don't think anything uh, malevolent or egregious happened on this site, certainly. Uh, I do think there was some oversight by the permit holder um, and that when it became uh, apparent that um, foundation work requiring heavy excavation was needed, they should have appeared for an amended order of conditions. Um, that's a typical process rather than just going through a letter for staff. I understand that given that the fact that no foundation existed on site and building needs a foundation to be stable, that you know, foundation work happens, but it is irregular for the process to go how it went. I don't know if it was necessarily um, trying to be, you know, sneaky or anything like that, but it, it is certainly irregular. And in reference to the water line, I know that's somewhat of a separate issue, but that also should have came for us for review for inclusion on a on a plan. I don't think any of these things are really things that should uh, interfere with, you know, the permitting of this structure. I think it's clear that the, all the uh, other activities have taken place within the existing footprint as shown on the plans that I just reviewed. Um, but I do think the applicant should have came um for the amended order for the expanded excavation, especially because we probably had some things to say about, you know, uh, siltation booming and sedimentation control and things like that. It, that is the, the standard thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Uh, Linda, I see your hand up. I agree in large part with what Seth said. I don't see, uh, Issuing an order of non-compliance is necessary in this case, but I also want to know what is the upshot? What are they asking for? For the building to be removed? Shut down? The use is not before us necessarily. That is a building department issue. Um, I'm kind of mystified as to, and I know the footprint is the same, um, I've known all these buildings my whole life since 1965, since he built them. And this was a combination of three different buildings that he stuck together that were down on the other wharf. But I'm just curious as to what are they seeking to have happen here? Remove the building? I do know that there was a concrete pad back there. Um, I guess if they're putting the uh, freezer, the uh, walk-in cooler on that concrete pad, I don't have a problem with that either. It's not part of the structure, quote unquote, it's a separate issue. So I'm not exactly sure what they want us to do. 
what's what's the upshot? Take the building out, take the cooler out. It's a commercial wharf. There are restaurants all over that wharf. And certainly the size of this restaurant is roughly the size of the Downey Flake, from what I gather from the seating, which isn't a very large place. It's more of a family oriented and it's not a bar and it's not the crew, which I find more um, irritating than the rest of the wharf. It's not straight wharf restaurant with alcohol service, regular alcohol service on that deck, which is facing the water. And it's you've got the boat coming in. You got all this other stuff going on. This is a commercial enterprise. It was a commercial structure before. It's on the same footprint. The pad is the same, roughly, as far as I can tell. And I don't know where we're supposed to go with this. If we issue an uh, a pro issue a citation for this. We're not taking the building back out of there. We're not taking the cooler back out of there. Where are we supposed to go after that? The wow. use of that 63 or 63, uh, I guess, seats is not, as far as I'm concerned, before me. So I don't know what you want us to do. So, I, you know, we do have town councils online here somewhere. Uh, John Giorgio is here, so maybe he can direct us. But I don't find any issue of noncompliance at the moment. Um, th thank you, Linda. I think um, they have requested that we issue a cease and desist until a proper amended order is uh, applied for, is, is my understanding. Um, but I saw Sarah with her hand up, so I want to um, give Sarah Alger a, a chance to reply. Yeah, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I thought I was clear. Um, I don't think anyone has talked about use except for um, Ms. Williams. What we're looking for is for this applicant to do what every other applicant does, which is apply for the proper permits, an amended order, file the appropriate plan so that the commission can see what it's approving, and go through the process like anyone else. And until they do that, I think you should issue a cease and desist. That's what we're asking for. No one said anything about taking out the building or any of those other things. Just do what they should, what they said they would do at the hearing, what is reflected in the minutes and in the tape, and come back for an amended order for all of the extended work that they've done. Um, thank you, Sarah. And I know, um, Ms. De Benedictus, um, you had had a comment or wanted to make a comment earlier. I want to make sure to circle back to you. Well, I think that it's indisputable that the commission never reviewed the plans included with the building permit application because they were never submitted to you. So they went in to and got a building permit to spend 1.275 million without it's ever conforming and asking you to issue an amended order of condition. And that's re what's required with the law by law. The required permitting by law has not taken place. And, and they even said that they recognized that they had to come in for an amended order of condition. If you just review the minutes of your own meeting, they recognize that, but they never did. So why should they be treated differently than any other applicant? Okay. Um, as a so matter of law, their, 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 their submittal is deficient. And, and as a matter of law, they, they, you should issue a cease and desist order, in my opinion. Thank you. Um, Mike, I see your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't see, <clears throat> obviously, um, as Jeff pointed out and Will pointed out, the, the building footprint hasn't changed. My, my only question is on the foundation work did, did staff know about the found, foundation work? Maybe Jeff. Madam Chair, if I may? Yes, go ahead. Is we did receive a letter from um, from Islet Environmental from Katie Barnacle in April of 2022 um, that referenced a geotechnical report that they had gotten that the existing slab that they had had was not adequate to support the load of the building and that they were going to be replacing the slab and installing some helical piers. Um, 
admittedly at the time when we probably looked at it and you know kind of given the the history of the site and what was going on you know just to speak for myself you know maybe we lumped that level of repair into the the way we wrote out the permit overview for the renovation and maybe we stretched that farther than we should have um for what it was in you know in the letter itself that there's a you know work will be performed within the building footprint soils will be left in place and concrete from the existing foundation where you're off site and disposed of in accordance with local and state and federal laws um and that it was still inside that building i think given that information at the time and also you know knowing that you know they're renovating a building to bring it into compliance with current building codes um you know we assessed that it was within you know keeping of the existing order of conditions at that point so i mean in, in my the way i see it is if, if that was the channel that was taken um you know the applicant did what they you know what they what what they thought was right and um the outcome is the outcome um you know I, i'm fine with it i don't disagree that uh to to seth's point but um i'm okay with it where we're at right now so i i wouldn't i wouldn't be in favor of a cease and desist thank you mike um linda i see your hand up and then seth i'll go to you and i do see you um mr benedictus as well thank you i agree with what mike said i was going to say almost the same thing about asking staff that they made the uh, the call that it was within the original order of conditions and the applicant relied upon that uh finding basically and now we're trying to rewrite history here when they relied upon that representation that they were within their uh, original order of conditions um based upon the staff not sending it to us if they would have staff would have sent it to us had they felt that they were outside the original order of conditions that's my point so i don't see how we can really issue a cease and desist based on that reliance um thank you linda uh seth i had seen your hand go up Thank you, Madam Chair. First, a clarifying question for the permit holder and then comment based on it. So has all of the foundation work um, been completed? Yes. Um, so given that knowledge, you know, really the only uh, concerns I would have through the order or amended order of condition process would be to you know really based on the construction protocol and erosion and sedimentation protocol and since we've already done the work and you know, we can't go back and change those protocols i don't really think there's anything to review at this point through an amended order um, again i think the process is irregular but i don't support a cease and desist um, and I don't support an amended order at this point because I don't really think there's anything to review. Um, so although it's a little upsetting how the process went, I think that um, the activities on site are at least substantially enough in compliance with the original of order of conditions that was issued to uh, be considered acceptable in my opinion. Thank you, Seth. Um, uh, I'm going to let Ian go, and then I'll go back to you, Mr. Benedictus, just to make sure the commissioners get their comments out. Of course. Um, Ian, go ahead. Yeah. So <clears throat> it, it doesn't seem to me, from what I've heard and read, that there was any intent to deceive. And as such, I don't know whether or not um, we we should uh ask for an amended order application i i agree with my fellow commissioners that i do not feel that a cease and desist is justified um and i think it's a very unfortunate state of affairs to 
have a bodice where they couldn't come to an amicable arrangement so that they're before us rather than <clears throat> working it out. But um, from what I gather, there's been no intent to deceive. And as such, um, I would leave it up to the legal minds whether or not we should have an amended order uh, to complete the process. So it's just very unfortunate, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. I would uh, agree with you because I, I think everything that's been done on this site, it is a provable, you know, by our commission. I do wish um, it had come in as an amended order, I guess, roughly a year ago. Um, but unfortunately, it didn't, you know, and even earlier in this meeting, we had an applicant do an after the fact kind of minor modification for us. So um, although it's not the way we would like this process to go, it unfortunately does happen sometimes. And I, I, I think the applicant did try and do the correct thing you know they notified the the office um it's not like they just didn't say anything to anybody so um i guess again i i would kind of echo seth and say this is an irregular situation and add like somewhat unfortunate but i don't think that it's something i would issue a cease and desist for at this point um mr benedictus i do want to let you speak because I think commissioners are um, quiet for a moment. And then Sarah, I do see your hand up as well. I'd like you to bring up page 375 of the packet, which is going to show that there is an expanded cooler and the footprint has changed. Um, well, can you bring that up for us? Was that? Oh, what was that page number again? I'm three, sorry. Three, seven, five. I have your letter up. Um, is there a page number on your letter? Or is that from the the entire digital packet. That's I'm from the about packet. The, it's from the packet. That might take a minute to load for Will. <clears throat> um, what what page of your letter are you referring to? I have your letter up. It's it's. I don't think it's in Danielle's letter. Oh, okay. It's on page twelve of my letter. Oh, okay. May I ask a question, Madam Chair, while we're waiting? Uh, yes, go ahead. So assuming you don't require an amended order, and this clearly is well beyond a minor modification, when they come in for a certificate of compliance on the prior order, will they be required to file the appropriate site plan showing all of the work that they've done? Um, they would need to um, provide an appropriate as built, yes, and any, um, you know, the foundation changes since one, it sounds like didn't exist beforehand. Um, they would have to represent uh, as part of their um, Which plan is that? certificate. Is this, is this Santa system? Assuming that they get a certificate. Yes. Okay. Um, so, Ms. De Benedictus, is this the um, page you're looking for? Yes, it is. And, it, and as you can see, if you compare this with the Santos plan that's on page 19, which is the plan of the existing conditions, that there is an expansion of the footprint. So I'd like to have page 19 brought up now. Mm 
I guess I'm having um, trouble comparing these two photos in this format. Seth, I see your hand up. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. It, it seems clear that the area represented in that red box overlaps with the area labeled as concrete pad in the other plan. And I guess the only thing we would need to parse out is um, what is the uh, actual activity is taking place on site. I, I know that previously there seemed to be an indication of lobster tanks, which would meet the structural uh, um, definition in our regulations. And now it's going to be a um, walk-in cooler, which, you know, I'm not in the restaurant profession, but I at least know close enough to what that is, which would also meet the structural, um, the structural definition. So I guess the only question is, is there any difference in the size of the structures? Like did the lobster tank fill up the whole concrete pad and is the walking gonna fill up the whole concrete pad? And I guess if there is any difference in size, then there is a change in the amount of structure, but I think it's honestly so minor that it's it's really considered within the same use of the uh, of the building. Thank you, Seth. Linda, I see your hand up. Jeff also put his hand up. Can Jeff go first? Sure. All right, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say, as it relates to the concrete pad walk-in issue, I, I think we're happy to go back. The, the Santos plan doesn't have that concrete pad specifically dimensioned. The dimension is the inside of that building that um, I just took it off my screen so I could see. Um, that 36 foot dimension, I apologize, I don't have the inches off the top of my head um, for what it is. We can happily, I'm sure, get a, a plan for everyone to review with the dimensions from Paul Santos's original plan to this plan for comparative purposes, if that would be easier for everyone. Um, so we're not guessing. Yeah, I think that would probably be useful just to have in the record. Um, Linda, I see your hand up. I have to sort of parse this out. The cooler on the concrete pad is a separate entity from the structure. Correct? So the cooler itself could be considered structural, but it sounds like it is. Oh, well, it, I guess um, the applicant should answer that, what it's going to look like currently. Gabriel. Okay. Gabriel, go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, the, the walk-in um, will not be attached to the building. Um, it's, it's very close, but not attached to the building. Um, we we determined the size, of, you know, I, I'm a cook by profession. I want the biggest walk-in I can get. We determined the size of the walk-in, how big of a walk-in we could order. It's a custom walk-in by measuring that concrete pad, the old one, not, not the new one. The, the new one doesn't exist yet. Um, but we, we went out, you know, we old schooled it with tape measure and it can be X by X. Um, so um, it's precisely the same size um, in terms of what's structural and what isn't that's above my pay grade. Um, but this is a separate building, or sorry, separate um, entity that occupies, in point of fact, a slightly smaller footprint than the lobster tanks. But for the sake of argument, we'll call it the same as the lobster tanks. Well, that's why that's what I was after is that it's the same size you measured the pad and it's the same size. Yep. Um, and that's how it was custom made for you because it had to fit within a very specific location. Yep, it's so, much smaller than we would much smaller than we would yeah, like. Would you like? And um, the structure is on the same footprint. So I'm back to the thing again that they relied on the representation from the office, the notification to the office. The office made the determination at the time that it was within the scope of the original order of conditions. And I'm gonna stay with that position, not to issue a cease and desist and not to ask for an amended permit unless sometime in the future they amend something else. I don't wanna go backwards when they've relied on this and they're where they are now. Thank you, Linda. Any other questions or comments, Seth? 
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And to that point, um, you know, the same size or smaller would be fine. Any expansion of the size is an issue, but sounds like that isn't the case. I'll look for the plan from Mr. Carlson to confirm that and any uh, narrative that the app or the permit holder has about you know what the actual size of the walk-in and how they determine that size would be great for the record. Um, but I I don't think there's any expansion in structural area based on the current conversation. Thank you, Seth. Um, so I I definitely agree with I think at least the majority of commissioners that I don't um, think that I see like a structural expansion uh, or a need for a cease and desist. Um, but I think since we are probably going to be waiting on a plan comparison, I, I would like to get an opinion from town council just because we have differing legal opinions here. And I think if we are going to um, maybe continue this discussion, having an opinion on whether an amended order needs to be filed in this case um, might be appropriate. Um, just to again, make sure that we aren't missing anything here. Madam Chair, are you asking um, me for an opinion now? I mean, if you're allowed to speak on this matter, certainly. Well, I'm allowed to speak if you want me to speak, that's for sure. <laughs> yes, I would I would love it. Yeah, so I don't, um, I've been listening to this intently. I, obviously, I haven't looked at everything in detail, but it, it does sound to me that um, as long as the concrete pad is not going to be expanded beyond what existed, I don't see the need for an amended order of conditions in this matter. That, of course, is subject to your obtaining a plan, which I believe you will be getting, and then taking a look at that at that time. And I'd be happy to work um, with Jeff to review that to see if, if our opinion or my opinion changes at that point. So I would recommend that you proceed in that fashion. <clears throat> and, and I would also say that issuing a um, cease and desist order is a matter of great discretion by the Conservation Commission. And uh, as long as you exercise that discretion in a reasonable manner, I would be good with that. <clears throat> um, thank you so much for your opinion. So are you telling us, John, that size is important for coolers? No, I, I think it's the pad that counts. I think that's what's important, Ian. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from commissioners for John? And thank you for stepping in. No problem. Okay, so it looks like no. Um, so at this point, um, we probably should continue this discussion if there's no other talking points for review of the comparison plans. And I know we have um, our next meeting is April 27th. <clears throat> Would anybody um, be opposed to continuing this until April 27th? Okay, um, so then we'll continue this discussion on April 27th when we have plans for comparison. Uh, and I do uh, appreciate everybody's time and everybody's comments and participation. I realize this is um, a difficult matter for abutters and, and the, the project applicant. Uh, so thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That will move us on uh, to discussion with town council of potential civil penalties for Two Gully Road. Um, and we do have John Giorgio on. Um, I know, Ian, this was one that you um, kind of spearheaded a bit. Um, I did. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you, John, for your letter dated to Libby, February 14th, 2023, sure. laying out um, how, that not only the potential remedies, but what you would recommend. 
And so I think, um, or at least the way I read it, that your recommendation was in your final paragraph, recognizing that non-criminal deposition tickets, tickets may not be much of a deterrent and that a criminal complaint would be difficult to prevail on, the town could consider issuing a demand letter for a civil penalty and if a settlement is not reached, authorize town council to file a civil complaint to Superior Court for a monetary recovery. And um, so that would be my inclination. And uh, the reason why I spearheaded this is because I've been feeling increasingly like the proverbial Dutch boy with his finger in the dike. And so I really would like to um, get everybody's attention on this matter that, you know, that, um, and yeah, so I, I would like to go as far as you feel is prudent. Thank you, Ashley, for letting me describe my feelings on this. Uh, thank you, Ian. It looks like Joe has a question or comment and then Linda, I see your hand <clears throat> up. Oh, Joe, you're muted. I do have a comment, and that is I don't support a fine in this particular case. And I say that because the party involved here has been apparently very cooperative, and we're getting about everything we can get out of them. And going and laying a fine on top of these people is really piling on. I don't think it's fair. If we had somebody who was really fighting what's going on here, I'd say, let's load up on the fine but not in this particular case. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, Linda, I see your hand up and then I saw Seth, your hand going up and Ian, I see you. I have in two minds after going out there that day, freezing um, and seeing how much money they're gonna be spending to rectify it. I appreciate what Joe said, but I also appreciate what Ian said because it what it does it may deter somebody from doing it in the first place if they know they're going to get nailed with that for doing it to begin with because ultimately they've gotten what they wanted their view just before they sold the property knowing that those things were not going to be cut down at that point and they weren't going to get their view back because those things are just going to grow barring the uh, invasive species over there and so i'm in both camps because it somewhere it has to be a deterrent and the public doesn't see how much money this family is going to have to pay to fix what they did and they never should have done it. So if the public thinks that we're just going to walk away because they don't see all the rest of this, there's a problem, I think, in, in perception. And we've got to make sure that somebody doesn't run around topping trees like they did out there off a of pulpit, doing this to get their view back. And then, oh, sorry, mea culpa. We'll fix it later on, yet the damage that they've done in the long term is not going to be rectified by all the stuff they're spending down there to plan it. So I think something needs to be done as far as punitive. It may not be $100,000 if you catch my drift, because that's what they're going to be spending down there, a minimum of what they're going to have to replicate or try to put back something. It's going to be only three feet tall, so it will survive and root. The issue to me is that somewhere along the line we have to have a fine as some sort of a deterrent that the public can see that we have done that because that's my biggest concern is that somebody's going to do it again and say oh God, yeah whatever i got my view and i'll just pay for it and that's the end of it and still they get their view even though they have to pay to fix it they're still going to get their view for the next 50 years so this is why I'm sort of in between, but I'd like Ian what Ian said. I like what Joe said, but I think we need to do something that's public. Thank you, Linda. Um, Seth, I had seen your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the enforcement order was issued against multiple parties. And I think before we get too far deep in this conversation, it's important to discuss which or which of these parties um, would be the potential subject for civil penalties as well. You know, it's important to remember that um, not only was the previous property owner, should they be held accountable for this, but the contractor who did the work also should be held accountable. 
And if you're a contractor, um, it's your responsibility to ensure that you have appropriate permissions to um, do the work that you've been hired to do in the area. And you know, ultimately, yes, it is up to the the property owner to make sure those permits in, in place as well. But both parties are equally at uh, fault here. So, you know, I don't think we're going to pursue civil penalties with the current um, owner because they weren't the ones who actually was responsible for the work. But I think if we're going to do civil penalties, it shouldn't just be for the previous owner, but for the contractor as well. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. And Ian, I had seen your hand go back up. Um, I, I was going to make the point to uh, Joe what Linda said, so I really um, I, I have nothing further to add, except that I have subsequently heard several people say that the feeling is that it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission. So I, I am very concerned that um, we don't, and as Linda pointed out, we've had these issues in the past, and so I think <clears throat> through you, I'd like to ask John, you know, what he would recommend so that we can try and and um, assuage this going forward. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, I have a cold. Um, th thank you, Ian. And I, I have to agree with Seth that I think if we I issue further penalties, it should be to the previous property owner who ordered the work and the contractor who did the work. Um, but I also, despite ongoing issues like this, um, agree with Joe that I don't feel it necessary to pursue harsher penalties um, because they are being agreeable and, and spending a lot. But I, I totally understand your point, Ian, and we want to dissuade this from happening, you know, period. Right. And if I may just say, Ashley, I mean, you know, they're being agreeable because they've got what they wanted. Or, you know, they have got what they wanted, so um, it doesn't hurt to be agreeable. No, and I, thank you for letting me emphasize that. No, and I mean, I, I definitely see your point. Um, Mike? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I have a, a few comments and, um, I don't know if I'd be correct on this one, but you know, they for the they, they could have come in for permission to remove invasive species, and we probably could have found a way to get there and happily removed black pines. Um, just speaking for myself, I don't know if everybody on the commission agrees with that. So um, for the record, um, well for for people in the future. That is just good to get get it out there that we would uh, be agreeable to removing invasive species. Um, I don't know if if I support additional fines. I'm just going back to we've got you know a resource area that needs needs work, and I'd like to see that move forward. And then I, I would wrap up my last comment, which would be a question to Mr. Giorgio. Do we think that? somebody could prevail, or the commission could pre pre prevail with that, or is it unlikely, in your opinion, that additional fines would ultimately be, be levied by a court? Um, and Joe, I'll let you get your question out, and then um, John Giorgio, maybe you can answer a few of the questions that are sure. out Certainly. there. Yes, I think my question will also apply to the attorney, and that is, if you're going to find both of those parties, how do you find them? What sort of percentage? Who's responsible for what? It's certainly not 50-50. And you might certainly argue that, wait a minute, this contractor was hired to do a job and did the job for the owner. The owner 100% and the contractor not. Do we expect the contractor to know all the rules and regulations? I don't know that answer. Seth? Yeah, respectfully, 
people operating businesses, um, you know, they, uh, they should understand that, you know, there's liability of business operations and that if you have any potential concern about there may be something wrong, you should go to the person who's hired you to do this work and confirm with them that you know, this is permitted work. Or if you have additional questions, the Natural Resources Department is more than happy to meet with anybody at any time to tell you if there's an issue here. If you are a, a landscape professional on Nantucket, you should be well within your knowledge to the fact that the Conservation Commission exists um, and that the wetlands protection regulations exist. Um, and honestly, you're, you're at fault if you aren't double checking before you do a job. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Seth. Uh, Joe? I wonder how many residents of Nantucket understand the rules and regulations of the Conservation Commission. I don't know that residents do, but I, I must say as someone who like was in the landscape profession for 11 years and Mike is currently in it, landscape company owners know there are wetlands laws. So I, I, I would say that um, this individual probably would have been aware. Um, and I feel like the way the work was done also hints at that because it was like a cut those trees down and get out of there before anybody sees you a sort of picture left behind. Um, so that's kind of my, my read of this scenario. Is that person a landscaper? I, I, I had not heard that. What I had heard is that the, this particular contractor hired two people to go in there and just chop everything down. I don't know whether that's true or not. That's third-hand information. That's why I say what I say about how do you share that penalty? 100, 0, 50, 50? I don't know. A, a good question. Linda? I mentioned before that somebody whose family lives out there got a hold of me. And after this all hit the paper, and told me that when they were walking around after Thanksgiving, you know, getting working off the turkey, they saw this happening. It was sort of late in the day. It was sort of really quiet out there. They were alarmed when they saw it, but they thought maybe they had permission to do it. They did not see a truck that was marked. And the guys were just cutting, 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 cutting. Because they stood there and watched it for a while. Now, my understanding is that the, the person that was in charge of that below the owners is, uh, is a landscaper. But it was done sort of under the cover of darkness, basically. And if I was going to apportion anything, it wouldn't be to the landscapers because they were hired to do just this. They didn't dream this up on their own. The owners of the property, you, at least in other boards, are completely responsible for whatever happened underneath them. Not the person who actually did the work, but the, the who should have known better. But the owners are the ones that are responsible, period. It's their view. They hired them. They told them what to do, and they did it. Um, thank you, Linda. I, I you know, uh, agree, but I, I also disagree. I mean, when the Holly Farm cutting got done, that landscaper got nailed. And he... Um, you know, was more publicly nailed than maybe the the property owner. I, I I feel like both need to be held responsible because the rogue landscaping like needs to end, and people need to know they can't just do whatever the property owner is saying. And I think people do know that, and then they are sneaky, which is worrisome. Any other questions that John might be able to answer before I gave it over to him? All right, so John, I'm gonna give it over to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> so in, in terms of my recommendation as to whether you should proceed with a penalty or not, 
Um, I'm actually not going to give you a recommendation on that because I think that's a policy question for the commission to decide. And as I said earlier, the commission has great discretion in terms of um, how to address violations such as what occurred in, in this instance. Um, I will tell you, however, that um, I'm, I hope you all um, appreciated the, maybe it was too subtle of a distinction that I put in my email to Libby. And that distinction is you really have two enforcement options here. The first is a criminal complaint, which, and you can um, you can seek a, a criminal penalty of up, a criminal fine, I should say, of up to $25,000 for a violation. And so the question here is, well, what is the violation? Is it one violation um, altering the resource area? Is it a violation per tree? Uh, I think it's probably reasonable to expect that if you do want to proceed, uh, a court is likely to say that the penalty is viol um, <clears throat> uh, doing work in the resource area without a um, without a um, an order of conditions. Um, the way, so that's a, that's a up to a twenty five thousand dollar fine. Um, the way you would proceed with that is um, the, the commission staff could certainly go to district court and file a criminal complaint. I'm not sure if staff has done that before, but it's fairly straightforward. You know, you may have heard about non-criminal disposition, which is the writing of tickets. Um, that, however, um, is limited to $300. You can't have a non-criminal disposition ticket for more than $300. If you wanted to seek a penalty, obviously more substantial, it would be you would file a criminal complaint in court. Um, we could certainly assist in that if it, if it came to that. And you would go before a judge and the judge would decide whether to issue a fine and in what amount. I think the judge would also look at um, who has to pay that fine. I mean, I think you could argue that it's both the contractor and the owner because, but you would have to establish that each of them violated um, the Wetlands Protection Act. So that's one track that you could take and the commission could, do that pretty much on its own. Obviously, we could help out if that's how you decided to proceed. Um, the second option is what's known as a civil penalty. And that's very different than a criminal fine. A civil penalty is um, you go to superior court, you file a complaint, and you ask for a judgment in the amount of up to $25,000 for these violations. Now, I would not recommend that you simply charge into superior court and file that criminal complaint. Uh, for one thing, I think you do need the permission of the select board because that is a civil action. Um, but I think the commission could certainly issue a letter to the responsible party and, um, and demand that they pay a civil penalty in, a, in whatever amount you think is appropriate up to $25,000. If they refuse to pay, then you would have to proceed with filing a complaint in superior court, as I just mentioned. I don't think you should proceed with issuing that demand letter unless the commission is committed to going forward with filing a criminal, a, a, a civil complaint in court. Now, <clears throat> the issue I see there is a, the transactional question. What would that cost the town to proceed with a civil penalty. Um, so you might want to think about if if um, you might want to think about what the appropriate amount of that civil penalty should be when you send that demand letter. And it's possible you could sit down and and um, uh, you know the 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 contractor or the owner could certainly choose rather than going to court because they're going to incur costs as well to pay the 
the demand that the, that the commission makes. So those are the two options. I think um, filing the criminal complaint and expecting a judge to issue a criminal fine, um, you know, judges don't really like to deal with that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm being frank. Um, and um, it's not clear how much you would actually in incur in legal expenses for the town um, if you did proceed on that route. Because again, the maximum is, is $25,000 per violation. So it's really up to the commission. I think the threshold question is, do you think from a um, policy standpoint that um, imposing some kind of a penalty or a fine as a deterrent, as I believe Ms. Williams indicated, is the right way to go? And if so, I think my recommendation would be that you decide on what the appropriate civil penalty should be and that you send a letter to the uh, responsible parties requesting, not requesting, demanding that they pay that penalty. And if they don't, then you need to be prepared to go to the selectmen and get permission to file a complaint in Superior Court, which only we can do, by the way, unlike this, the uh, criminal fine or the criminal complaint, only we could file that on behalf of the commission. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, Joe, I saw your hand go up and then Seth. So Joe, go ahead. 25,000 you'd burn through without even thinking about it. And, and I'm the criminal, I'm John, you're the judge. And I'm saying they want 25,000. Guess what? I just put up a security bond for 250,000. And they want 25 more. I don't think that's fair. Um, thank you, Joe. Uh, Seth and Ian, I did see your hand go up. Thank you, Madam Chair. To Mr. Giorgio, uh, apart from the differences in, you know, the filing of the criminal complaint versus the civil penalty, is there any, like, finding that needs to happen by the commission to indicate that the activities, you know, exceeded a civil level and went into criminal category, or is it really just um, two different? Um, yeah, no, those are alternative enforcement uh, options that you have. The Both the law and your bylaw permit either pursuing a criminal fine or a civil penalty. I suppose in theory you could also do both, but you know, I'm not sure a judge is going to look too kindly on that. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, and you know, getting back to something that Mike said earlier, you know, I think I do agree that if this had come to us through proper permitting, that most of the people on the commission, or I'm not going to speak for everyone. Some of the people, including myself, probably would have been more than willing to uh, proceed with permitting for the project. I would have spoken uh, in high favor of, you know, removing invasive Japanese black pine and restoring a native ecosystem with the types of plantings they've proposed. Um, so I think that's out there, and uh, so I. I don't I don't know if necessarily criminal behavior has taken place on this site. I think like theoretically the civil penalty route seems a little bit more uh, reasonable. I do think that if we do have to go to court, we're probably going to spend more than twenty five thousand dollars pursuing that case um, if the judge even rules in our favor and assesses that maximum penalty which who knows if will happen i think you know i think there is a strong precedent to be set policy wise for um enforcement so i don't necessarily mind going down that route even if it ends up being fiscally not not so great uh, i think pursuing that against the property owner and the contractor as i said before is important um, but I don't, I don't, I don't think it's really going to be significant for the former property owner financially in comparison to what the cost of the 
restoration is going to be. Uh, just one uh, last question for town council before I um, end my speaking turn. If any civil penalties were assessed, where would those funds go to? Do they go to the Conservation Commission or do they just go to the town's general they budget? Would go, they would go to the general fund of the town. Thank you. Uh, Linda, your hand has been up and then Ian, I'll go to you. We need to be realistic here. I understand that 25 grand to somebody with a billion dollars isn't going to mean a damn thing. The issue is that it will show the public that we have reacted appropriately and it will be public and they will look like we've done something to support what we do here on top of the fact if it means nothing, then they won't have any trouble paying it. That's the point. To go back to that other argument that was just came up, drop in the bucket, fine. But it looks like to the public that we did something proactively to hopefully send a message that we will come for you if someone else wants to top those trees and someone else wants to just clear cut everything in front of their house for their view for whatever reason. Then there is going to be, we're paying attention and there's going to be a reaction. That's the point. Not the fact that it's going to hurt them by giving them 25, by paying out 25 grand. That's the point. I think that's what Ian is trying to say. That's what I'm trying to say. And I don't agree that we should do a criminal disposition. I agree with the uh, less uh, hostile approach to this. And I think they will understand that because they know what they did was wrong, but they did it anyway. There you go. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Ian and then Joe, I see your hand up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so through you to John. So um, you you say that the that that a judge would not look kindly on a criminal complaint, but from a lay perspective, my perspective, that's exactly the sort of complaint that would really get the attention of the public at large, the uh, the malefactors. And it would be less expensive, apparently, than going through the criminal procedure. So why do you, but of course, I accept your advice that that shouldn't be the way we should go. But I'm wondering why a judge wouldn't look at that as being criminal behavior. What have I, what do I not understand? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, Ian, I certainly appreciate what you're saying, and I don't mean to suggest that you would be unsuccessful in getting a district court judge to fine um, potentially both the prior owner and the contractor. And I do think it would be cheaper for the town. I do agree with that. Um, but you could also, you, you can, the alternative of issuing a demand letter for a civil penalty um, is something, you know, that the responsible parties, when they get that letter, could very well say, well, we're going to, we're going to sit down and talk to the commission and, and we're going to pay that civil penalty. And that's not going to be an expensive proposition in terms of legal fees. So then the question becomes, the real question is, well, what if they say, look, it, we're spending 100000 200000 whatever it is, and we think the commission is being unfair as a matter of principle and also seeking a civil penalty, um, then they may refuse to pay it. And then you go to superior court, and that's where I think it can get more expensive, if, if, if I'm making any sense. Right. No, completely. And uh, which uh, to me is an... Uh, but maybe not correct me if I'm wrong, from my perspective, that is why I would like to pursue a criminal complaint to bypass that issue in order to make an example of them so that it gets everybody's attention. I know that from my perspective, if someone took out a criminal complaint against me, it would get my attention. So if I may, Madam Chair? Yep. You know, Judges, um, and we're all getting a lot of experience observing how judges behave these days, right? And, um, and, and they have a hard job. 
They have a very hard job and their dockets are filled with all sorts of really unfortunate behavior and, and, you know, really bad actors, you know, and then they get something like this, you know, I, it's hard to predict. I, I think it's very hard to predict what a judge might do in district court. Um, but um, it, you, you sort of have to put that ball in motion. Whereas the civil penalty, there is sort of a first step and maybe you can achieve the same objectives, you know, if you sit down with that, um, with the owner and or the, um, the contractor and see what you can get to, I think, achieve the goal that Linda's been talking about. And I don't mean to put words in her mouth, but it's deterrence for other people who might try to do something like this in the future. <clears throat> right. And so if I may, just one final question, because I absolutely get the feeling of reading between the lines here, that if one is not successful with a civil complaint, can one then take out a criminal complaint? Or are you really locking yourself in once no, you those, go down the civil lane? No, those. I think those are alternative enforcement options. Thank you, John. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Joe, your hand had been up. Yes. Uh, I'm commenting on this stuff because I deal in a number of these situations and they're always messy and they're far more expensive and they take forever. And I could just picture the, Ashley, you making an announcement to the town that we really did a job on these folks. We fined them $25,000 when people are paying $3 million to buy a house here, an average house. It's like pocket change. It's not, people are going to say, what, 25,000? Should have gotten a lot more than that. I think the real story is the place has to be restored. That's the real message. Um, yeah, I see it both ways. Honestly, to the property owner, might not be a big deal. To that contractor, he's not oh. going to go cutting in a resource area ever again without he'll be wiped he'll be wiped out the contractor right and that's the deterrent so that no other contractor is going to touch these jobs without proof of permit and that might be the the bigger message to send I, I have to use my own personal experience i had no idea all of these rules and regulations existed that I'm involved in now. I had no idea. I'm a lot brighter now. And I'm thinking of other people walking the streets. They don't have a clue. Yeah, but again, if you're a company owner, I, I think the message needs to be out that if you're in the landscaping world, you need to know I've the seen, plants and the areas. I've, I've seen some of the landscapers yeah. in my neighborhood. I cut my own lawn. So I don't have them on my property. Yeah. Um, Mike, I see your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would say landscapers are probably getting an education um, for the ones that do choose to watch right right now. But um, I mean, I, I, I too am, am, you know, I'm torn and I respect both what Ian and Linda and everybody has to say. I, I don't see, I'm just going to jump ahead and, if we ended up in the select board's hands, I don't see that they would su support this. It just is too messy. Um, so I would rule that, that, that one out. And then on the criminal complaint side, taking into account what Mr. Giorgio says an extra burden for staff, um, I'm just questioning the upshot there as well. Um, so those are my final comments on it. And I'm, um, and I'll be interested to hear what Seth and John have to say. Uh, thank you, Mike. John, I see your hand up. So um, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, I had thought about, well, should this really be an executive se session discussion? And, um, you know, I, I, uh, I did not recommend an ex executive session because I think this is an important conversation for the commission to have publicly which you're doing now. So one of the options that you have here, you don't have to make a decision tonight. 
um, you could continue this um, and think about it, think about the implications. You also have the option of um, seeing how the restoration goes and, and how well they do the restoration. And if they do the restoration, no matter how much money they have to spend, I could foresee the commission saying, well, you know, our goals and objectives have been satisfied, um, but this is held over their head while they do that restoration. And if they don't do it properly, an option would be to proceed with some kind of a penalty or a fine. That is an option for the commission to consider. Thank you, John. That's a, a good, important option to have on the table. Uh, Joe? The one point though that I would raise is, it's my understanding that the folks that had this work done are under a three-year commitment to make sure whatever is planted is gonna grow successfully. They have a big commitment in terms of what they're gonna do. They're just not doing one round of planting. If the deer goes through there and eat out half of it, they gotta replace it. They're on a hook for a lot of money. Um, yes, that's true. Um, so, um, and Seth Wilkinson, I know your, your hands up, um, I think for other pieces of this kind of discussion, um, as far as the, the restoration work that's started already, um, it, it was actually a clarification to a comment that was made when, when I'm recognized. Oh, okay. Go ahead, Seth. Thank you. Um, with just with regard to the amount, there there have been some amounts that have been thrown around, and naturally, I can't disclose a, a, a contract value with a client. Um, but I and I and I hear very and, and I, I agree with uh, Commissioner Williams, uh, you know, and and Engelbert and others who you know trying to stop this from happening. I I spent uh, over a decade on the MACC board of directors, and this was a big issue for me that unfortunately we weren't able to make a lot of progress on, you know, this is a big, this is a big problem throughout Massachusetts. Um, <clears throat> and what I've learned over the years clearly is that uh, you, you can't, you, you can't find uh, enough to dissuade um, owners from doing this under the current uh, legislation, under the current regulations. Um, it's just not, they're not punitive enough to when the, when the values of views are so high in Massachusetts, Nantucket in particular. Um, but the, you know, reference that this is at least a hundred thousand dollars. Um, it's a lot more than a hundred thousand dollars. And I, and I do think that the commission could issue a, a press release. Um, and, and, and that could make a, a very, uh, big impression on a lot of folks. Um, I mean, you're, you're you're probably not going to know the exact value of the plantings, but a, a performance bond is being negotiated for a quarter million dollars right now. That's indicative of the value of the plants. Um, so, um, you know that that might be a way to accomplish what you're ultimately trying to do. The other thing I would caution the commission about is, uh, in my experience, and I do a lot of this type of work, it's extremely rare for these civil penalties to be. Uh, held up and actually issued and ultimately paid. Um, it happens. It's very rare. And so I think, as, and again, I'm, I have had no conversations with the owner about fines. Our, our role has been exclusively on this restoration plan, which is, you know, about to go forward. And frankly, this conversation makes me nervous um, about if it's going to go forward. Um, it is right now. Um, and so the um, you you have the ability to you know publicize that, um, and I think that could make a, a a very significant impression on folks. And you really need to think about it. if you find and you don't win, what message does that send? Because you are, I think I think you just heard from town council, you have someone that's willing to spend a very large amount of money, which is a penalty, um, bird in the hand. Um, you could try to fine for twenty five thousand dollars might be enforced. It might not. And if it's not, I think you just made, I think you, I think you just had the opposite effect that you're intending. And really I am saying this in the spirit of 
wanting people to not do this anymore. <laughs> but unfortunately, they keep doing it. So that's, I just wanted to correct the record on the, the value. It's it's quite a bit higher than 100,000. Great. Um, thank, thank you, Seth. And Michelle Hunton, I see your hand up. And then I think we're probably getting ready to make a decision or continue this. Um, so go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Ashley. I'm here on behalf of the D Martinos, and I just wanted to echo some of what Seth just said. Um, I do understand the commission's frustration with this and the, the interest in deterring the public. Um, obviously, that's that's a good goal. Um, but I did want to just say that I think by the commission issuing the enforcement order and requiring the monitoring for three years and also the, um, the surety bond, I think, um, and also I, I like the idea of some sort of press release and showing what the requirements are, but I think that does go a long way in deterring the public. And um, I also just wanted to reiterate in my experience and dealing with some of these civil penalty cases, I do think the town would probably wind up spending more, you know, and losing money on it. And I think, um, you know, in showing the public the amount of restoration work that is being done here, I think that would be a sign to the public of um, and a deterrent because a lot of people wouldn't want to spend, <clears throat> excuse me, that amount of money <clears throat> for restoration work. Um, and I just wanted to reiterate that our client is, you know, working towards this. We actually have access agreements to begin the work next week and we have a surety bond almost in place. So um, we just would like to hopefully move forward with this. And um, I think moving forward with the work and publicizing that could be a good deterrent to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ian? Thank you, Madam Chair. So through you to John, so taking both what Michelle and Seth has said into account, um, if, if the commission chose to pursue a criminal complaint, would that negate any of the other enforcement uh, aspects of this? Or would the, um, would the guilty parties still have to um, abide by the uh, conditions to restore the damage that they had done? Well, I think that um, the commission has issued its enforcement order. Uh, it's, it's very rigorous. They have to comply with that enforcement order. I think whether the commission decides to seek a civil penalty or file a criminal complaint would not alter the fact that they have to comply with the order. Um, now, again, we're sitting here in open session, but, um, you know, you, it, it sounds to me, and I could be totally wrong here, I haven't dealt at all with this issue, you know, with the other parties, but it sounds to me like there is, there appears to be a good faith effort, at least at this point, to achieve the remediation goal that I'm sure the commission wants to see. Um, and again, so that may be a reason why the commission may want to consider just holding off on a penalty. Let's see how the remediation plan goes. I'm not suggesting you wait for three years um, for, to see if the plantings take hold, but it sounds to me like you'll have a pretty good idea fairly soon whether or not these owners and you know intend to follow through on their commitments. I have no reason to doubt they will will not follow through, but you know, you may want to just hold off and see how they do with the compliance with the enforcement order. Because if they violate the enforcement order, then that's a whole separate penalty situation right. Right. that no, you would have available. You. And uh, so I guess, yeah, I, I guess that's uh, sound advice. And uh, I guess probably <laughs> as I calm down, um, taking all these factors into account and publicizing it, that seems like a worthy first step, but maybe we should table it and give it some thought. So that, I guess, is my own response now, is that I would like to table this and give it some further thought. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, John, very much. Thank you. So um, Linda has her hand up and then Seth will go to you and then I think hopefully we will be ready to table this or continue the discussion at a later date. Uh, Linda, go ahead. I agree with Ian. 
Um, and I agree with what uh, John said about waiting and seeing what they're going to do, because they're obviously going to have to start planting now and cleaning up the site because it's, as Mike knows, it's planting season coming here. They're going to have to water it and all that other stuff. And because I brought that up on site with you guys um, when we were out there, Seth uh, Wilkinson, not our Seth. And um, I said, you're going to have to water this stuff. Otherwise, it's going to die out there because we had a pretty dry summer last year on top of it. Um, so I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to think about it. If um, people are more comfortable waiting until the next meeting, I'm willing to do that. But I find great uh information from john and from seth wilkinson about this and um same thing with michelle so i'm willing to wait uh, thank you linda uh seth engelborg go ahead thank you madam chair and i don't mind waiting either but i think it's important again to draw the distinction that you know the enforcement process um is needs to be different for the previous owner and the contractor. I think the Di Martino family has has been a good actor so far and has been willing to you know fund the restoration and I see that as a benefit. But the contractor who did this work is essentially completely left out of that process. And I think that as you the chair said before, we need to also hold. Um, contractors accountable. And if we don't do any um, thing, whether it be a civil penalty or a criminal fine, then they're, they're not being held accountable. So I think there might be two separate ways we need to go in this case, but I think we can wait to determine. I do have a question for town council um, and I and I think it's good that we're here in open session today because I think this is important for the public. But are we able to continue this discussion in an executive session? Uh, because that might become pertinent at, at some time. Uh, John Giorgio, do you have a response? Um, I think if the if the um, if if the uh, commission wanted to have a further discussion about enforcement strategies and filing a complaint versus, um, you know, issuing a civil demand notice. Uh, I think there probably would be an option to do that in executive session. But, you know, now that you've had this initial discussion in open session, I think it would really depend upon with, if you're discussing strategy with respect to litigation that's imminent, that is a reason for an executive session. Thank you. Would there be an open meeting law complaint and a challenge? There very well could be. Um, but, um, you know, that's what we do every day. We, we respond to open meeting law complaints. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, just the last thing is, I think uh, some type of press release uh, is also a, a good idea. Thank you, Seth. Um, so, John, do you think we need to continue this discussion to a date certain no. or just no. take it? No. Nope. Okay. You okay. could, but I don't think that's necessary. Okay. Perfect. That's kind of the answer I was hoping for. Um, so I don't know, commissioners, if if you, we want to make a motion to issue a press release, if that's kind of where we are falling at this point, or make a motion to continue this at a later date for discussion of a press release, or just continue at a later date to see how the enforcement is kind of proceeding. Well, Yep, if I may, without dragging this out any further, but to Seth's point, which I think is a really valid one, is how do you emphasize that it's not only the property owner, but the contractor who needs to pay a penalty? Do we need to go into executive session uh, at our next meeting to discuss how we can further that goal? Because as Seth has so rightly pointed out, right now the contractor has skated scot-free. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you, Madam Chair. And that was the purpose of the question to town council. I think 
that you know the reason for the executive session would be to not jeopardize the specific actions that we intend to take on specific parties and uh, discuss the strategy with respect to individual parties. Uh, John, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, I mean, I may have absolutely no basis for saying this, but um, from personal experience, I hired a contractor who installed a generator for me and shame on me, I didn't check the zoning bylaw and the zoning bylaw, the building inspector said that it was um, encroaching on the side setback. And so what did I have to do? I had to move it. Um, and if you hire a contractor and that contractor doesn't fulfill the terms of the contract, you as the property owner have the potential for a civil remedy against that contractor. And I, and I, I have no idea whether there's any thought of that or whether what's going to happen there, but there is always there is always that risk that if a contractor doesn't perform according to the contract, they can be held liable to the owner of the property. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jeff, I see your hand up. Yeah, I was just going to quickly an effort to kind of wrap this up a little bit. I think Will and I would be happy to put together kind of a, a, draft, a draft press release. I know they're scheduled to start work out there um, here pretty soon. Um, and I, I think we have pretty clear instructions for, you know, obviously some details of information to be in that press release and what the expectation of the commission is for restoration. Um, but I think we could get that put together for you guys to consider at an upcoming meeting um, and are happy to do so. Because that may accomplish a lot of what we're trying to accomplish, too. Um, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Mike? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll keep it very brief, but I, I think what um, Jeff is suggesting and John is suggesting gets two, two birds with one stone, a press release and table the discussion for uh, for a later date. I think it's a good solution. Um, thank you, Mike. Um, so do we need a motion to issue the press release? Probably would be a good idea. So does somebody want to make that motion? Sure. Uh, so motion made by Ian. Is there a second? I'll second it. Made by Linda. So by a roll vote, Beal. You're muted, Mark. He's trying to get the button. Just put your finger up. I'm running out of steam here. I haven't eaten all day and I have I've just got to stop. Look, people, I got to the school at 7 a.m. this morning, so no one is right. I, I, go, I didn't have an eat. I haven't been able to eat. I haven't had time. Linda, same here. Um, yeah. Engelborg. Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. I wanted to ask a question before we started that. And that is, are we releasing it or are we preparing it and reviewing it? We're going to prepare a press release. Jeff and Will are going to do that. It's going to circulate around for approval, any editing, and then I'll probably have to sign it or something along those lines before it goes uh, out. Yes. Uh, Williams? Aye. All right. So that carries unanimously to um, issue the press release detailing what's happening uh, out at the site as far as the enforcement is concerned. Um, yes, Joe? You said release. I thought we were going to re have it prepared and right, review. Right, we will. Sorry, okay. my wording here at 919. Jeff and Will are gonna draft a document that's gonna go Good. around to the commission and you're gonna lose your chair here, like literally because- yeah, We're done with that discussion. Forth, like this is crazy. Like stupid. Really crazy. Like, um, so we're tabling I... this discussion to a, not a date certain. <laughs> we're not releasing anything till it goes around to the whole commission and we are moving on. On. And, and may we all thank and, John for his advice. Yeah. It's like, thank oh, you, John. I love to watch sausage being made. So, <laughs> but right, thanks very much, it. everybody. Let's keep going. If you, thank if you. If anything else, let me know. Thank you. Thank you, John. All right. So that brings us to enforcement actions, potential enforcement actions. Don't care. Well, <laughs> I, 
I do because we need to bring up this Millbrook Road thing and we need to issue an enforcement to to Marty McGowan is my my feeling with the road grading that has been incredibly inappropriate, his inability to show up weeks on end at this point, throwing literal debris into wetlands and causing sedimentation. Oh, for God's sakes. Yep. And it's been weeks. So I don't well, know if you want to yep. give the commission some details, but um I think we're done with the nice letters here and he needs to be in front of us. I agree. I'll make that motion. Uh, would somebody like to second? Absolutely. All right. Uh, so by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Zarelli? Aye. Landowski? Aye. Williams? Aye. All right. So that carries unanimously. Madam Chair, did we ever resolve? They keep cutting North Liberty Street. I went down there today going back to town that back way from the cliff. And I, it looks like they keep cutting and throwing it over the edge into the into Lily Pond. I don't know what's happening there. It's not just the trees that they cut, but now it looks like there's a bunch of debris behind it just rolling down the hill. We did ask Will to have a look. Will, have you been able to get out there? Yeah, um, so Jeff and I actually made a site visit out there. Um, silt fencing was still up. Everything was in the limit of the work, but the lilacs um, that were removed that were potentially on land bank property, they weren't, they were up towards the road. Um, and I believe they're working with the land bank to replace those plants. Um, but everything else on the site, as far as the sycamore maples, seem to be within the limit of the work and within the limit of the silt fencing. Uh, did it you was go a, by it there was, today? It was, it was oh. a messy job site. This was a week ago. I uh, suggest you go back over there today because I saw them when they just cut How them about down. Tomorrow. Yeah, fine. Today's a little uh, late, but it's uh, there's a bunch of debris stacked up, piled up behind it, going down towards the lily pond. I don't know what they thought that was going to achieve. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take a look tomorrow. And just to kind of round that out, too, is we also have been working with the land bank on how they want to proceed for the work done on their property as well. So we'll package all that up and, and bring it all together at once. OK. Um, all right. So that moves us on to the SBPF update. Um, they you did put the sand that? on it. Yes, the sand was pushed down and we got a flurry of email forwards today. Um, one including uh, their removal plan. Um, I don't know if commissioners had a chance to look at that. No, I just know that they put the sand there because I checked that. Okay. Uh, Mike? Thank you, Madam Chair. When they when they come in at two two o'clock in the afternoon, it's on the day of the meeting. It's very difficult to get a chance to to look at them. So I have not. Um, I know I um looked through the document, but Jeff, you can go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to suggest we just got everything in this afternoon and have started getting you know, things posted and made publicly available. I think given the, the nature of the project and the way it's set up right now, I, I think our thought would be to give everyone a chance and the public a chance to respond and just require that any comments be in the Friday prior to the next meeting on April 27th and then have a more robust discussion then and a more robust discussion when it's not 9.30 at night. Um, I, I agree with that, but I also, um, because I was able to look through the removal plan, uh, and I'm still concerned we're maybe not getting the detail necessary to actually execute a removal. Um, and I, I would like to get an executive session on our calendar regarding this matter. Um, I don't know if other commissioners are interested in that, uh, but I'm concerned um, 
that we're, we're not getting the robust information we need to actually execute a removal. Well, I would certainly uh, agree that we do seem to continue with uh, delay after delay. So I would be happy to have an executive session yeah. to really decide how to go forward from here. And I understand that we're no longer meeting on Tuesday the 11th with the select board at five o'clock. Am I correct? Oh, we're not. What happened to that? No, we still are. Yeah, I think oh, we still yeah. are. Okay. Yes. Yeah, very much so. Good. I, I would say real quickly to the executive session comment, um, I'll have to clarify on the grounds that we would be meeting in executive session for that and yeah. square that away. But I'm happy to to do some digging on that and then get back to the commission because executive session isn't always an available choice, but I, I can certainly resolve that. No, and I, I completely understand. I'm just, um, maybe we put it at the end of our April 27th after this discussion continues, um, but I'd like to be pre prepared for that. Um, the other thing we do need to do tonight is continue the removal date because I believe that was set for maybe like a week yeah. from today. Uh, and if we're continuing this discussion, we'll have to continue that removal date as well. So right now the removal date is set for April the 27th, which is the day yeah. of the, the next meeting. Yeah, that was my motion. That's why I remember that. I would say the, the following meeting after that is May the 11th is the next meeting after the 27th. Okay. So I don't know if commissioners feel comfortable, you know, leaving it on the 27th or feel that we should move it. Uh, Seth, I see your hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're all beating me to my points today. Um, the first being, I'm not sure specifically if any of the 10 purposes for executive session apply. So we'll have to check uh, through council and staff on that. But I understand your intent. Um, the second being, I think we should um, advance the removal date further um, in case, you know, some unexpected circumstances, what caused the April 27th meeting to be canceled and would be out of luck. So I would yeah. say at least at least to the May 11th meeting or possibly even, even further, um, but I don't want to keep it on the 27th. And then the last thing is very briefly, I agree with uh, Mike that, you know, late day submissions of documentation is difficult. I had a very brief chance to look at what was submitted. I also don't know if it's risen to the level of specificity that we've asked. Um, but maybe if we you know, take the time between now and the 27th and are able to direct questions through staff to the appropriate um, consultants, some of that specificity might, might be, might come out. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. Mark? Thank you, Ashley. I just uh, note that Vince is still with us and uh, at the joint conservation selectmen's meeting, there was some activities, some discussion, some even motion towards the town filing an NOI for uh, the project. And I wonder if that's anything happening. If we're talking about removal, we ought to talk about uh, so other potentials. This is strictly on the removal order tonight. Our discussion with the select board, I think will continue on Tuesday as far as that's concerned. Um, okay. Yeah, but kind of keeping these issues somewhat separate because our select board meeting is more planning for an entire area. Although this project is in that area, it's slightly different. Uh, Seth? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just getting back to the removal date, because um, we've gotten to the point where we've had to extend it like at least four or five times now. And, you know, I, I get it, but just logistically, even if we had a um, completely, uh, ex completely like agreed upon removal plan in hand today, we're still, which we don't. We'd still be talking about several months before 
you know, that removal could take place. So I think we can extend it past May 11th at this point. I think we can honestly, you know, I, I want the enforcement order to stay valid and I want um, us to continue to let the appropriate parties here know that there is pressure to do what we're asking of them. But I think we can extend the removal order like maybe mm -hmm. two months at this point to give us the time to appropriately plan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Seth. Uh, Jeff? I will say we do have a meeting on, um, there's May 11th, May 25th, June 8th, and June 22nd. Okay. I would caution to only extend within that window just due to the fact that there is a possibility that the July 6th meeting could potentially contain new commissioners. Yep. Uh, Joe, I saw your hand going up. Yes, I did have a chance to review the documents this afternoon when they came in. And uh, I found the removal to be informative. Didn't have all the detail you might want be looking for, but it was very informative. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Meredith? Hi, good evening. Uh, Chairman Erzman and members of the commission, obviously Meredith Moldenhauer on behalf of SBPF. I'm joined tonight with uh, Mark Haley. Um, just want to indicate, obviously, I know you all have been working really late. You indicated that you've all been up really early, but we are, we are here um, on behalf of SBPF, obviously taking the steps um, as required to remove uh, the GO2 project. Uh, Mr. Haley is here. If you do have questions, uh, the chair made comments about, you know, having concerns about the what was filed. We are here to at least engage or hear comments. Um, that way we can respond to those accordingly um, if necessary, or obviously if those individuals need to review what was filed and submit it through Jeff, uh, we will obviously be able to respond to those prior to the next um, if necessary. Yeah, I think I meant by my comment, um, when we asked for these plans, you indicated that you were going to produce plans for all three options, like not to choose one. And I really didn't see kind of differentiation in today's um, submission that really identifies like different aspects of those plans and how they would be executed differently. Um, I, I think I was expecting more of a like contract ready where the safety protocols were outlined, you know, already um, so that we had that information in order to, to choose the safest plan, et cetera. Um, and, and I thought it was more of a kind of general submission on, on your removal. Um, again, we got we, Mr. Haley's here and he's got his hand up. We've done a lot of work yep, to put this yep, together. So I'm still speaking. Thank you. Um, and, and I was going to say, I, I, it was submitted late enough that I, I just read it over once quickly. You know, we do ask that submissions come in before the meeting. I realize we asked for information for April 6th for this meeting to be reviewed. You guys submitted it on the 6th, which is generally frowned upon, you know, for actual conversation at meetings. And next time we'll have to be abundantly more clear about submission deadlines so that we can properly review and have discussions on the nights that we intended to have discussions. Um, Mr. Haley, do you have a, a comment about your plan? Did I miss something in, in what I'm saying? Sure, Madam, Madam Chairman, is is maybe I we misunderstood what you wanted. We chose a specific removal plan and eliminated the three to one, and it's the one we have is a more of a hybrid plan. And the reason you don't have a lot of the more specifics information is we had a meeting with the town, and I approached most of the departments in the town that might be involved. We had, I think, Jeff, you came to a site meeting and the building commissioner came to a site meeting. And based on that, I need to, before I can put together plans, I have to understand what is the status of the houses that sit on the bluff. And you're correct. If you, if, when you read the 
memo I wrote or the letter I wrote, it indicates in that letter that we will be preparing contract documents for the removal, which includes earthwork, health and safety, and all the aspects, dewatering and, and the like. But those cannot be prepared until I understand all the criteria that all the people have for the removal. And that's what we're essentially undertaking now. What I did in the letter is to describe what that all entails. And the key piece, and I think your concern is about safety. And I totally agree. The safety of this job or this project is very tantamount in my mind. And we will follow the uh, OSHA requirements, but a lot of these are chosen by the contractor. So we need to you know, have contract documents that define the criteria and the procedures, but ultimately he's going to have to establish his health and safety protocols in a health and safety plan, which will be submitted to us for review, and also a job uh, action plan. So if he looks at the risks of his people doing the work and essentially then uh, uh, provides us input of how that might be done safely. And I've gone and I've talked to a number of contractors of how they might do it. And each one has a different idea, but there may be places where we end up tying people off. The other is, I, if you look in there, I have a whole instrumentation and a quality control program. I wanna instrument the houses, backs the road and the slope. So as we're doing the work, we know what the ground is doing. And that's very important for all of us to understand. And that's what's in the protocol I wrote out this time. And that will be incorporated into the contract documents. Does that make sense to you, Madam Chairman? It, it does. How long do you think it'll take to get those documents in front of the commission? Is It's on my time plan. It looks like it's somewhere in the four to six week time frame to put together a whole contract package. And also then... The construction manager, which is Jamie Feely, will we will start to go to subcontractors who would actually do the work and start getting pricing from them. And that pricing will be done, which fits the schedule we had that we wanted to do this during summer months, which would be sometime in the June timeframe that the work would be undertaken. Uh, thank you. Uh, Joe, did you have your hand up? Yeah, what I was going to do is just clarify what I said about the document. It didn't have ABC choices. It had a plan that was laid out, and I thought it was pretty good. Yes. Um, any other questions or comments from commissioners? Okay. Um, so we need to, um, I guess, continue this discussion until April 27th. I don't know if we should be sending these documents to our independent reviewer again in the meantime, if we haven't, and we need to continue the removal date. So Seth, I see your hand up. Uh, yes, Madam Chair, if I may to Mr. Haley, it sounds like None of the contract package, which has the information that I'd be looking to review more in depth, could be available by April 27th. Is that correct? That would be correct, Seth. Thank you. Um, and so, although but, I but could, but I could, can I ask? And sorry to interrupt, but what would you be looking for? Maybe I can provide more details of what I wrote up in the protocols for you to be able to look at, but. This is relative, it, it's, a, it's a big earthwork job is what we were simply doing, is it's cutting the geotubes and removing the sand and replacing the sand of the Toa slope. That's essentially what it involves from a construction standpoint. And if you, if you or Ashley could help me understand what you're looking for, I can, we can probably provide that by the 27th, but I need to understand what exactly you're looking for. Um, thank, thank you. And once I have a chance to review the document more fully, I will confer that to staff who will confer it to you. I'm not that'd, that'd be great to do it tonight, but I appreciate that. Um, so then I think I would like to, to keep the 427th meeting on the schedule, but then I'd also like to hopefully schedule another meeting with a date certain uh, around the time 
when the full package would be available uh, to review that as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. We still need to extend the date. Yeah, and as I said before, I I personally like feel comfortable with extending the date the date until early June at, at this point. Agreed. Uh, Joe, I saw your hand up. Do we have to vote on extending the date? And if we yes, do, we, we should do that before we forget it. Yes, that's that's what we're getting to. Um, so, would somebody like to make a motion to extend the removal date, Joe? What date do you want to extend that to? How about May? Well, we're already we'll... almost in May. Our next you. meeting is the 11th. Well, the I think we should go to June 1st. June, June 1st. June 1st? That's fine. But we June don't have first. a meeting on June 1st. I think we're trying to keep this on our regular meeting schedule, um, which I think- June, June, June 8th, Madam Chair. Okay. June 8th. June 8th. Whatever it is. Um, right. But with a request that any- materials needed for that meeting let's say be provided uh at least by monday june 5th no it, it's got to be the friday submission okay. for friday that, the normal friday, friday june 2nd yes not a request hey it, it, how about me. may 25th guys we that's, just we just no, made june 8th june 8th that's my no, motion june 8th this is like funny money here tonight. So June 8th is the, is the date. I, I think, Joe, are you keeping that as your motion and self, Seth, yes. helping out with the date? Yes. Okay. So Joe made the motion. Is there a second? I seconded. Seconded by Linda. So by roll vote, Beal? Aye. Engelborg? Aye. Erisman, aye. Golding? Aye. Mizzarelli? Aye. Landowski? Aye. Williams? Aye. Great. So the removal uh, will be continued until June 8th. We'll continue um, discussion of the removal documents until um, April 27th. I don't think we need a motion for that one, um, but I do want to just say on the record again, I feel like we were fed misinformation when these geotubes went in as far as the ease of executing a removal on multiple occasions. Um, and I, I understand why it's so difficult, but again, the information presented to us um, was quite different. Um, all right, so that'll move us on in our meeting to reports. Uh, we have Crack. You do? I, I, I have absolutely nothing to report at 9.43 in the evening. Uh, CPC? Uh, no meeting. Okay. Uh, NP and EDC. Oh, that would be Seth. Seth, NP and EDC. Oh, I can't. We can't hear you. Do we? You lost sound. Do you have anything to report? Thumbs up, thumbs down? Nothing? Okay. Um, so Harbor Plan? We um, have decided on the uh, boundaries. That was a big deal because for uh, the state to approve us going forward, we had to send up that we have uh, voted on the boundaries. So that's up. And then we're meeting. Um, I don't even remember at this point. Well, I think it's Monday the 10th. That's when we're meeting. Monday the 10th. Okay. Uh, and then the offshore wind work group. Less than 60 seconds, and I'll give you the scoop on what's going on. I call Lauren Sinatra, who's the core energy coordinator, and she said, I'm glad that uh, you're going to be on the group. We haven't met since last July, but that's okay. You're on the team. Here's what we'd like you to do. We'd like you to review this document because in four days from now, we have to turn in some reports. The document is 1,927 pages long. The only information I gleaned out of scanning through that thing was 
the distance between Nantucket and the nearest windmill is 23.3 miles. That's the end of my report. Thank you. Uh, so commissioner's comments? Great meeting, time to go. Um, I, thank my you. iPad died in the middle of the meeting. That's why I was struggling very, very, very back very. online. If I can be. <clears throat> you should have spilled your ice cream on it, should you? <laughs> I just want food. I have not eaten since five o'clock last night and I'm I'm over it. Okay, um, Seth had his hand up and then I have a comment. Seth, what are you trying to say? Uh, two things. First of all, thank you so much, Madam Chair, for trying to keep this together. I, I apologize for any behavior that um, was out of line. And I know this has been a bit of an odd meeting, so I appreciate your uh, professionalism here. Um, and then the second thing is, uh, I know at one point we were going to have a discussion of, you know, our open space part of our um, our prerogative here. And I know that was taken off the agenda, which is fine. Um, but if, you know, if you and I could meet or the staff need to meet to discuss how to move this forward, uh, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Seth. So um, I've, I've met with staff because I know we had a question about enforcement. <coughs> had a meeting and put a big list together of like ongoing enforcements that include that hummock pond road to get documentation for for hopefully a meeting soon or a special meeting also have that in the schedule to meet regarding open space just to make sure we have the documents and all the information to present to the commission because the last meeting we just had nothing in the packet so if you do have the materials because i know you've said you've done some research um and i know that will would have those materials too but um anything that you think we should include um kind of clearly send it to them if it hasn't been already and then we're we're going to get it on um an agenda i know there was a member of the public asking about one of our properties on Facebook recently, you know, so it's definitely um, in the long list of things that the commission is is dealing with right now. Thank um, you. I, I will prepare uh, some relevant information and get it to the staff. That, that would be great. Um, and then I, I know this is a tough meeting. It's really late, but I do just want to remind everybody to like respect each other and to respect, you know, people who are speaking from the public. Uh, and to really try and um, maintain that uh, and and not interrupt each other. I know there was a, a lot happening tonight, but I think um, even myself this evening got to the end of my rope and I think we um, just need to kind of keep perspective. Uh, Mike? Just wanna say thank you. Um, it was a very um, long meeting and uh, tough to get through and we even wore the Nantucket current out. They They went to bed and posted. Uh, before we finished. Of course they did. Can't wait to read whatever that says. Um, it's always something. Um, so if there are, oh. Ashley, Mom, which, which end of Millbrook Road should I go visit? The, the Hummock Pond Road side. Hummock Pond Road. All the way to Pumpkin Pond. There's like issues that have been created all along. I guess it's the east side of the road. Okay. Um, Just right. don't drive off the side. Great. Right. Well, and part yeah. of the maintenance there allowed for a vehicle to be able to go off the side more easily. So it's all relative. Um, administrator staff reports. Do you guys want me to talk for 11 minutes so that this is five hours no. even or? No. Then good night. Yeah. <laughs> we'll um, so would somebody like to make a motion to adjourn? Mike's making the motion, seconded by Joe, by roll vote, Beal. Aye. <coughs> aye. Garrisman, aye. Golding. Aye. Mizzarelli. Aye. Landowski. Aye. Williams. Aye. All right, so this meeting is adjourned and Will, I guess we'll be in touch about signatures and other things. Indeed we will. Okay. Um, no, have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.
Ich fuck das jetzt. <lacht>